Okay. Okay. Okay, everybody, it's seven o'clock, so we'll start uh, the meeting. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this evening's meeting. Thank you to all the substitutes, councillors, and thank you for so, so many members of the public to attend uh, who are welcome to be here and listen to the debate, and, and hopefully nice and quietly. Thank you. So we'll start off with the, the agenda. We've got apologies for absence and substitutions. Uh, we've got four substitutions. We've got Councillor Young for Councillor Kumar, Councillor Kelly for Councillor Alexander, Councillor Kingston and Council for Councillor Dinza and Councillor Hashani for Councillor Haley. Next item is declarations of interest. Do members wish to make any declarations of pecuniary interest? Councillor Crawford. So I don't believe these are pecuniary interests and I'll check with the monitoring officer, but I think it's incumbent on me to declare them chair for uh, interest of transparency and it's quite lengthy so um, apologies but as with the um, calling in July uh, everybody needs to know that I was a member of the regulatory committee that heard the Warren Farm Village Green application uh, in I think it's 2016 but I stand to be corrected on that um, and then in terms of sport given that this 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 impact on um, local and national sport um, I've previously been a consultant for Supporters Direct, which is now the Football Supporters Association, the Football Association, the England and Wales Cricket Board and Sport England. Um, I'm still an accredited uh, sports journalist as in accordance with my register of interests. Um, I'm advised that I should declare that I'm a season ticket holder at Fulham Football Club, who are still in the Premier League. Um, I'm a board member of the Fulham Sports Trust and a member of Middlesex County Cricket Club. Um, I, and what I would say is I haven't disclosed, I haven't discussed these proposals with any of those bodies, and I would not do so. Where my work um, coincides with my council duties, I recuse myself from any any discussions, and I would do that um, going forward. Uh, but if any member of the committee, or indeed anybody, has a problem with me. Uh, being here, I'll recuse myself from this meeting as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Crawford. Anybody else? Councillor Kelly? Only, only that um, Councillor Dan Crawford um, reminded me I was also on that regulatory committee a number of years ago. Thank you. Right, that's great. Thank you. Uh, next item matters to be considered in private. I'm not aware of any. Good. Thank you. Minutes of the meeting held on 12th of January. Do we prove it as a correct record of the meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Now we have two substantial items tonight. One is the call in of the future of Warren Farm Sports Grounds. And then we also are scrutinizing the budget strategy, which is going to cabinet tomorrow. So it's two big items which will be lengthy and, and important, but we need to be very mindful of time for the first item because we do need to discuss the budget strategy. So I want as many contributions as possible, but if we can be concise in our questions and comments. Thank you. So we'll start off. Um, the, the process for the call-in will be Councillor Malcolm will present the call-in. Um, we have two external speakers, Dr. Spencer and Dr. McCormack, who will both present, and then Councillor Costigan will, uh, on behalf of the Cabinet, and then we'll have questions and then the debate in the normal way for a call-in. So without spending too much time on the bureaucracy, we'll crack on. And Councillor Malcolm, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Liberal Democrat group accept their report health outcomes in Southall, but there is no evidence that sports pitches on Warren Farm would improve it. There is also no real want by residents for cricket or football on Warren Farm. The council's own survey said that. Um, also, if you did believe there was a need for expanding football or cricket, 
the seven other sites quoted in its council's own documentation more than cover the number of sites and pitches that are proposed for Warren Farm. In fact, in the council's own consultation, one respondent quoted, I'm a professional qualified football coach and have coached youth teams for local teams, including Hanwell Town FC. We do not need more outdoor grass football or sports pitches in our area. We have loads of football pitches and parks. As a coach, I have never struggled to find somewhere for matches um, or to coach on. And I think that's very clear. Also, the decision by Cabinet is very inconsistent with many other of its own policies, and it's not what people, our electorate, want. Many priority species, not just the skylight, will be harmed. The proposed land for the sporting pitches will do the most harm of any particular section of Warren Farm. The sink review, which is an internal document by the council, is still not completed. And that, I understand, will show um, there is great harm to be had by any development on Warren Farm as it is. Over 19,000 people have signed the petition. Two and a half to 3,000 people were outside according to security numbers tonight. That shows there's a real um, need um, to make the right decision tonight. It's also against the biodiversity action plan that the council produces itself. Also, following on from that, the plan would probably be turned down by Natural England due to the existing range of priority species that will be lost. And it isn't just the skylark. There are many other species that will be lost as well. A judicial review, a bit like what happened 10 or more years ago with QPR, would probably entail a huge bill for the council with no real gain to any resident in the borough. And it would take money away that could be spent helping people in Southall or the rest of the borough. So in closing, I'll just say the Liberal Democrats believe if the council is going to do something this damaging to our biodiversity, it would need a watertight case. It hasn't got a watertight case. I've mentioned three or four strong areas there. So to me, the only real choices the council have is to send this back to cabinet tonight and they can reconsider this. And that might allow them to put that off, get the results of other surveys and then come to a more suitable and sensible decision at a later date. But I'll close there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you. So we have two uh, external speakers. I don't know who, which one of you would like to go first? Dr. Spencer? Yeah, okay, Dr. Spencer, thank you. Over to you. Um, can everybody hear me nice and clearly? Thank you very much for allowing me to come and speak here this evening. Um, it's fair to say that there's quite a wide range of legislation in this country that relates to biodiversity in the natural world. Um, I believe that various elements have not been actually addressed properly through these plans and the town plan, but I'd like to concentrate on one specific element, which is the sync review process and how that fits in and aligns with government policy and specifically also with the mayor of london's um, environmental strategy and the london plan and the sync review is an incredibly important part of actually how we make an assessment about what's important on a site um, the last sync review was undertaken back in uh, 2018 and was finalized by the consultants ecology consultancy and submitted now that report says, and I have a copy of it just here, that, um, and this relates specifically to Warren Farm, that an increase in boundary to the existing sink, which is essentially the woodland at the bottom, the area known as the earlier Jersey's field, and also the Imperial um, um, uh, College land, there's a recommendation and the increase to the boundary includes the disused area of sports and school playing fits and sand pits, by which they mean, you know, the core area of the buildings, uh, which appears to support acid grassland. Acid grassland is a UK priority habitat. It is specifically addressed in the GLA strategic plans and in the biodiversity strategy. It is also mentioned in the ELIC strategy. The positioning of these football pitches would cause the destruction of that grassland because it is right in the middle of that space. Now, further to that, um, uh, and afterwards, the council commissioned 
um, Arab, forgive me, I'm just going to wave this here in your faces, forgive me, um, to review the evidence across all the various requirements under planning law. Uh, and I've got this diagram here, which comes from the Arab plan, which shows Warren Farm here at the bottom in orange. Now, what's interesting about this is that this diagram, which is essentially Arab doing the work that was requested by Lingberry Council, puts the existing Warren Farm those as owned by the council in an area of white space. It doesn't connect it with the existing sites of importance for nature conservation in the area. If we then turn to what's in the Ealing Biodiversity Action Plan, forgive me, hopefully you can see, I've got handouts which you could take later on. You can see down here, Warren Farm here in green is surrounded by sink sites, these sites of importance for nature and conservation, including Imperial College, the Earl of Jersey's Lab as the woodland, and the ancient hedgerow, which runs along the, on the boundary. This is part of the existing sink site. What Ecology Consultancy was doing was recommending the inclusion of the acid grassland and Warren Farm within that overall sink. Those results don't appear to have been taken action or discussed. The data has not been deposited with the local biological record center. There are guidelines about how this has been done and, and the Ealing Borough Council actually has an SL agreement with, with our local biological record center. Finally, from the point of species that are going to be lost through this action, I want to draw you to this map. This is data of the time part I have access through to my role as the London Natural History Botany Recorder and the, and the BSBI. Oh, I have got it the right way around. And you'll see that these red dots represent individual species of six or so of the rarest and most endangered plant species on Warren Farm, including copse bindweed. Copse bindweed is nationally recognized to be vulnerable to extinction, which means it means it's, it's extremely high risk of extinction in the UK. This dot here is Warren Farm. Warren Farm is the only known extant site for this species in the whole of Greater London, and it's one of very, very few across the whole of the United Kingdom. The sports pitch proposed area is smack back on top of where this incredibly rare plant species is, and all of the other rare plants which are indicators for acid grassland. So the positioning of the pitches will cause the destruction of priority habitat, and it will also destroy and destroy the and cause the loss of many several other species of priority species, which are listed in the GLA's um, documentation. So far, we have listed approximately 20 species of plants, animals, insects, etc., which are UK Section 41 Natural Environment Research, I'm sorry, Natural Environment Research, Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act priority species. They are of material consideration for you when you're making planning decisions. You are required through the planning regulations to give equal assessment of all the different requirements, and that also includes biodiversity. And many of these elements, I'm afraid, have been overlooked. Just over three million. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. McCormick. Thank you. Uh, Warren Farm Nature Reserve doesn't need Natural England sign off to be recognised as one of the most precious wildlife hotspots in Ealing. If we lose it, we lose an extensive area of wide open grassland meadow habitat, the likes of which cannot be found elsewhere in the borough. We would, it's true, lose Ealing's only breeding skylarks that account for a significant proportion of London's breeding population. But this is not just about skylarks, a little brown bird that sings a nice song. Now, I know a lot of you in this room and listening and watching tonight have wondered what's all the fuss about skylarks. Well, skylarks are a symbol of wide open landscapes of times when our surroundings were richer for their abundance, were humming with life, not depleted, gray and silent. They're an indicator species for the overall health of intact, vibrant ecosystems, which provide us services. And they're an indicator for many other less visible or audible species. To have them breeding in Ealing is a jewel in Ealing's crown and an asset to this council's green credentials. Councillors, eliminate them at your own risk. This will be a PR disaster. Uh, despite what was said at the recent cabinet meeting, they do not breed across the road in Osterley Farm, nor will they survive on the crumbs of Warren Farm left behind if these plans go ahead. And incidentally, they don't enjoy long vistas either. 
But let's get off the topic of skylarks. There's many other species that rely on this space in our increasingly urbanized landscape. And that the council's own biodiversity action plan promises to protect and enhance habitat for. Linnets, barn owls, peregrine falcons, swifts, house sparrows, bats, hedgehogs, slow worms, grass snakes, common toads that are not so common anymore, pollinators, invertebrates, and wildflowers galore, all important. The proposed development is in breach of Ealing Council's Biodiversity Action Plan, but also its own climate and ecological emergency strategy. The Council's own local plan red flags the loss of biodiversity, habitat, and green space in a park's depleted area. The addition of the Imperial College land to the proposed nature reserve would not mitigate this loss, and it is entirely misleading to suggest it would. To label this one of London's biggest rewilding projects when it will obliterate almost half of already rewilded Warren Farm is a total nonsense. Having recently been through the process for a genuine rewilding project, Beavers at Paradise Fields, I can tell you that Natural England will not look favourably on ecological destruction dressed up as rewilding. It is greenwashing, plain and simple. Public and expert opinion is firmly against this proposal. Since Ealing Council published its plans on the 17th of January, another 5,000 people have signed the petition, asking for local nature reserve status for the entire site, taking the total currently to over 19,000. A number of high profile experts, wildlife organisations and charities have criticised the decision and supported the campaign. London Wildlife Trust have said they could run the entire site as a local nature reserve and can get funding to do it. An offer to sponsor the site for rewilding has come through Rewilding Britain, brokered by myself to councillors Costigan and Mason, yet it wasn't entertained. In a climate and biodiversity emergency where wild spaces are being fragmented and destroyed bit by bit, we cannot chip away at these precious remnants of nature and claim it's in the best interests of children and future generations. We're well over three minutes now. One second. One second. This space is just too precious to room with sports facilities that could be accommodated elsewhere. The proposals are untenable. We need to go back to the drawing board to actually achieve, achieve Yeah, the speaker said that that is Oh, right. Okay, I think we've got the mics sorted out. So, uh, Councillor Costigan is now going to respond to the call in, and we'll go from there. Councillor Costigan. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you um, to those who've called in tonight's proposal. It's unusual um, for a cabinet member to say that, um, but I think it's um, very useful to be able to have the opportunity to set the record straight on Warren Farm, uh, because I do think um, with some of the discussion tonight and perhaps some of um, the kind of Twitter um, discussions on this matter, uh, I think people may be under a misapprehension of what the actual decision taken by the cabinet was. And of course, that decision was to make 62% of an expanded site, um, which is at the moment mainly uh, disused playing fields uh, into a nature reserve. That is the main part of the decision um, that we are looking at tonight. And then the second part of the decision, of course, is that the remaining 32% that we do a feasibility study uh, to look at putting uh, playing pitches on that part of the site. So I think it's useful to be able to clarify that is what we are looking at. Um, Chair, I wanted to just go through um, the points that were raised in the call-in documentation, uh, because I think that's what um, councillors are here to look at tonight. And this uh, particular um, uh, decision was called in 
on five different grounds. The first one was on proportionality. Uh, and basically it said that, you know, yes, we accept um, that there is inactivity and health outcomes issues in South Hall, um, but does this relate to um, the outcome you are trying to achieve? Of course, we know from the cabinet meeting that two in five people in South Hall do less than 30 minutes per week um, of activity, uh, and that's twice as bad as the London average. So there is really, really low levels of, of activity in South Hall. The health outcomes, there's a 10 year difference between the lifespan of a woman in Norwood Green versus Northfields ward uh, and there is worse outcomes for um, diseases such as um, diabetes and coronary health um, uh, sorry coronary heart disease obesity and mental health is also much more of an issue in South Hall. So we have made clear in the uh, document attached, the response to the call in, all of these health outcomes. And I think there is a stark case there um, for the levels of inactivity and health inequalities in South Hall. However, it appears to me what the um, spokesperson for the Liberal Democrats is saying is, yes, we agree that there are significant issues with health inequalities and deprivation, but we don't think sports grounds are going to address that. I don't think that that's a valid argument. I can't see that anyone would see that that would make sense. I think the report makes clear that this is the right place and these are the right people that we need to get involved in sports. And we've made that clear. Um, due consultation was another area and um, that this was called in on. Uh, we have outlined in the report that, in fact, looking at a sports facilities and where they need to go is something that um, you don't consult on um, in terms of having a survey. Um, what you do is you actually ask clubs what the demand is. Uh, and you look at that. And we've asked clubs, if you have a look at the report attached, um, there's significant detail. Uh, for example, there's been a big increase um, over the last just one year, um, a 21% increase in teams playing football in the borough. And there are a significant number of teams who are having to play outside of the borough or um, are, aren't able to run some sessions. So we consulted clubs and we consulted the national governing bodies for cricket excuse me, and for um, football uh, in coming to this decision. And of course, we also consulted local people. We did a consultation of local people and the aspirations that came back were, yes, many people uh, wanted to see a nature reserve on the site. And indeed, that is why we are saying that 62 percent of the expanded site should be a nature reserve. So I think, Dr. Spencer, you know, that's good news. We are making 62 percent, nearly two thirds into a nature reserve. This was also called in on the grounds of human rights and equalities. And we, um, yeah. we're, we're at four minutes. So. Yeah, and I did I did time some of the previous speakers and they were well over five. Oh, give you um, <laughs> thank you. So in terms of human rights and equalities, um, there is no evidence that there is any negative impact on um, equalities. Uh, and of course, the opposite is the case. Um, playing pitches will um, allow diverse audience, including disabled um, football players. We've already got work um, in the borough, uh, people of all ages and government data, in fact, has pointed out that the most vulnerable um, will uh, benefit from playing pitches. The um, Colin also said uh, that, you know, did this actually link up with some of our um, council strategies? Of course, our council plan says that we will expand community sports facilities in the borough and our sports strategy, which is key to this, highlighted the need. And there has been uh, a couple of mentions of seven sites. In fact, we have looked at 29 different sites in the borough and they are all listed in full in the report chair. And if you go through them, you can see there are very few sites where there is any additional additional cricket or football grounds that could be put in. In fact, some of the sites, we might have to reduce the number of pitches in there. So it's quite clear that Warren Farm is the main place in the borough that we could put um, these facilities. And you really can't just add one here and one there. You have to have a facility that can wash its face and where you have those economies of scale. The last area that was called in on that's, was... That's because that we're well, well over time. Okay, I'll, sure. I'll finish then by saying the last um, was budget. We've made clear on budget. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I ask, behave yourselves, please. Treat the speaker with respect. Any more outbursts, we'll, we'll halt the meeting. Councillor Costa, please finish. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, the last um, area was called in was budget. It makes clear there is a budget uh, for the feasibility study, and that's what we're agreeing. So finally, just to say, um, I do believe very strongly that what we have here is the best of both worlds. 62% of the site, at a minimum, will be a nature reserve, and a um, and 38% of the site uh, will be put aside as a maximum for playing pitches, which are so much needed in the borough. I hope that the person who's coughing in the back is okay. Yeah, could we maybe just check that they're okay? Any water? Did someone have water? Okay. Thanks, Councillor Costigan. So next step of the calling is for members. To... Okay. Everyone, calm down now. Thank you. So now, the members of the committee will ask questions of the of Councillor Costigan or of Councillor Malcolm. So, if it, oh, okay. So, okay, Councillor Newstub. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, Councillor Costigan, could you talk more about the process for creating a local nature reserve and what we um, what we now do? Because obviously that's right front and centre with the cabinet proposals and the and the instructions to the um, uh, strategic director to go ahead with that. And I'd really love to understand that process and how quickly that can happen and we can actually start protecting that sixty two percent of the overall site, including the land that's been secu secured from the, um, the uh, Imperial College. Thank you. We do rounds of questions. Councillor Ball. Uh, yeah, so um, I had a question for um, Dr. Spencer, uh, which is what, what are your qualifications to be an expert witness for us tonight? Uh, and a question for uh, Councillor Costigan, uh, which is um, that you, you clarified in your remarks that um, the decision is for a feasibility study for for the sports pitches, but listening to the expert evidence that we've had today, um, do you still think it is feasible to have the sport, sports pitches without destroying the value of the local, of the, of the Warren Farm Nature Reserve? And so we'll go for Council Coskin to respond to the first two questions. Right. Um Thanks uh, both for the questions. Um, so the in terms of the local nature reserve uh, declaration, and um, that's covered on uh, 4.18 onwards in the original cabinet report. Um, and just to clarify, um, we're not just seeking to make um, part of Warren Farm a nature reserve. It's also, as I say, the uh, imperial um, field, uh, the Imperial College site uh, adjacent to Warren Farm, and additionally, um, three of the meadows uh, are adjacent to Warren Farm, and that's Jubilee Meadow, Blackber Blackberry Corner, and Trumpers Field. So we're looking to make all of them local nature reserves. Um, and as part of the local nature reserve process, uh, you need to agree a management plan uh, and what we're very clear on is that we want to include local groups, local residents in agreeing that management plan. Um, that management plan then needs to be um, agreed um, with Natural England. And that's that's you know the, the, how the process um, uh, goes. We've got a timeline again in the um, back of the cabinet report. Uh, and that's item uh, 17 in the cabinet report where we have um, included um, some of some of the timeline and what we would hope is that the nature reserve um, timeline would be parallel to that so that we'd be able to do both things at the same time uh, and actually do some of the work on investigating um, the feasibility of playing fields at the same time as we move forward with agreeing a management plan um, with Natural England uh, for those uh, five different sites that we are declaring a nature reserve. Um, Councillor Ball's question uh, on the feasibility, um, I think that's what the feasibility will do. That's the entire point um, that the feasibility study will look at the moving to the next stage, uh, you know, whether um, this is feasible, whether this is something that we can do. Um, we've also said it would be costed. Um, it's very, um, it, it's very key uh, that this is something that we're able to fund um, that makes sense financially. 
Um, so we would be looking at, for example, working with the English Critic Cricket Board and the FA uh, on potential funding streams um, for the playing fields uh, going forward. Uh, but that would be very much part of the feasibility. And of course, um, as with, you know, uh, you know, any kind of uh, um, idea like this, and at the moment we're at the ideas phase, uh, but any kind of idea like this, as it crystallizes and moves on in the process, there will be, of course, um, work to be done around looking at the ecology of the site, for example, and making sure that we have the lowest possible impact on that. And that would be standard procedure um, for any such proposal. And again, um, just to um, kind of refer to um, Dr. Spencer's uh, words on that, you know, we are nowhere near a planning application. This isn't a planning application. This is just a decision to, as I say, first of all, make most of the site a nature reserve. And secondly, to do a feasibility and look at whether there is a way of providing much needed playing pitches on the smaller section of the site. Thank you, Hans Costigan. Uh, Dr. Spencer, if you want to answer Councillor Ball's question. Um, I have a degree in botany. I worked for several years for the London Wildlife Trust doing GLA habitat surveys and sink reviews. I did one last year for Richmond, which took less than a year. I worked at the Natural History Museum for 12 years as curator of the British and Irish Plant Collection. I am the botany recorder for the County of Middlesex for the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. I am also the London Natural History Society's recorder for all of the vascular plants in the London area, which means I have overview of the botany data for the whole of the London area going back for the last 400 years. And I have worked extensively in the past with Giggle and other partners, both regionally and nationally on biodiversity and botany. Thank you. Councillor Young, you're next. Could I ask Councillor Costigan please to comment on paragraphs 413 and 414 of the report, which are on pages 27 of the agenda or 13 of the report, which refer to the loss of acid grassland, which is highlighted by Dr. Spencer, and the reasons why a large area of, of this rare grassland is so important. Could you also comment perhaps on um, what the Labour Party manifesto of 2022 said about rewilding? Councillor Sorry, I thought you were taking a few again. No, um, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Young, for the question. Uh, yes, so um, section 413, 414 and 415 of the report um, uh, and 416 uh, explain in detail why we have taken the decision to declare 62% of this site a nature reserve. That is literally the evidence for that decision that we have made. Um, we do note um, that the um, that 10 years ago, when there was a much uh, bigger proposal um, to develop the site in a much more intensive way than is currently being put forward, there was an ecological appraisal um, that took place. And that did find at the time um, that really um, there wasn't, uh, there was limited uh, um, ecological value in the site. Um, however, um, you know, a lot um, has happened uh, in 10 years. And certainly um, with any proposal going forward, when we have a proposal on the table, then we would, of course, look at doing that again um, and see um, what we would need to do to ensure that any proposal had the lowest possible impact on the ecology of the site. Um, but that is uh, something that we would do further on um, in um, the decision making process. Um, as I say, at this point, that is not a situation that we're in. We are starting with a feasibility study. Is this even possible? Um, could it be paid for? How would we do it? That's the step we're taking now. Um, but we have, based on um, the previous um, evidence, we have already taken that decision to make 62% of the site into a nature reserve. Um, and so that is why we took that decision at Cabinet. Paragraph, four, paragraph 414 says it. And also you haven't mentioned anything about rewilding. What, what, what did the manifesto which you stood on in 2022 say about rewilding? Okay to go, Chair. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm just going through the chair. Um, 
yeah, apologies for that. Uh, I missed out your second question. Uh, and the second question was our commitment to rewilding. And yes, and um, we have a really uh, ambitious commitment um, to rewild in our borough. Uh, and we uh, made, we have promised as part of our manifesto commitment to rewild 800,000 square metres of the borough, which is equal to about 130 football pitches, in fact. Um, and we are going to do that. And we're already started with our plans for Warren Farm, where we are going to rewild, as I say, 62% of the expanded site. Councillor Young, Councillor Young, through the chair, it's not a conversation, these are questions. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Chair. My questions are for Councillor Malcolm, and there are a couple of them. Um, I don't wish to rehash the discussion we had in July. I, I just ask, uh, where is he's over there? Sorry, Councillor Malcolm, I was looking in the wrong direction. Um, I, I just asked Councillor Malcolm to confirm that he remembers the exchange we had about cricket and football pitches in July, and if he can assent to that. Uh, to remembering that discussion. Um, his, his call in and the call in of the opposition parties clearly states the report does not make it, and I'm quoting, does not make a clear evidence based case for putting football pitches on Warren Farm. The documentation that we've been provided with, and indeed the report, specifies that not just the seven pitches to which um, Councillor Malcolm refers, I'll, I'll refer to the so that just the numbers of the briefing note that make this point. Does he recognise and accept the statistics within the briefing mm -hmm. report, within the briefing note and the cabinet report, but specifically in the briefing note in section 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8 and 4.9? And if he does, which group are listed there that will miss out, that needs this sporting provision, does he wish to disenfranchise from playing sport in England? Is it, uh, sorry, kneeling, forgive me. Is it uh, young people? Is it the disabled or is it women? Thank you. Councillor Malcolm. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I think when it comes to demographics that you, you've stated there, if you rewild um, and keep um, Warren Farm as it is now, um, any demographic of people can go there, young, old, those with disabilities, those without disabilities. That's the, that's the first point. If, if you look at the, the cited, the seven I listed, um, you can see half of them either can expand for football or cricket or possibly can. There's one that can't, um, but that's just those seven. And you've listed, I think, 29 you quoted. Um, there is no need at this stage, but if you did want to expand, there are many other sites in the report gives that evidence. But as I stated just then, the... Uh, Warren Farm, as it is now, is a habitat that you, whatever demographic you are, can enjoy and go there. That's cool. That's cool. Food. Sorry, Chair, you didn't answer the third. Councillor Mapper didn't answer the third question, which was which group under the sports strategy, under the provision that's provided in the report, uh, young people, women, or disabled people, does he wish to prevent from playing sport? It's quite clear in the in, it's quite clear in the it's quite clear in the documentation. I'd like Councillor Malcolm to answer the question. Councillor Malcolm, I would say that all of those groups um, can play if you expand on some of the examples given in the report. There is a feasibility that can be done on all of those. You're making a decision on Warren Farm that you could wait a year or two years and look to expand on those other seven sites or even others that have got some sports there. There is a number there that you need to look at first. Why are you making a decision now? You could wait two years and expand in other areas. So no one suffers. Can we stop shouting out from the audience, please? It's rude, it's inappropriate. And I'll ask Councillor Driscoll to question. But no more shouting, we'll hold the meeting. Thanks, Chair. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, so firstly, um, just in terms of the sites of importance for uh, nature conservation, so the sink reports, is there sufficient information in the sink reports that the borough undertakes to assess what is in Warren Farm? 
as it is now because we have historical information which are which by its very nature is quite some time ago um so is there sufficient information to make a decision um as part of the feasibility study the recommendations of the original council uh, cabinet report authorizes the director of economy and sustainability to undertake in certain tasks and but it's about the viability of sports in the area so is the budget which is fifty thousand, sufficient to undertake sufficient uh, investigation into the habitat in the area and my final question in terms of the use of imperial college land i know we've had correspondence councillor uh, costigan um but the options about using that land for sports and i know there's a preference for rewilding on that land but is that being pressed and what type of discussions have gone with imperial about using that land so that less of the now warren farmland is used that's costigan uh, thanks councillor um, so just in terms of um, the sinks, uh, at the moment, Warren Farm itself, the, the um, former playing fields in Warren Farm, aren't a sink. Um, it's the land adjacent that's a sink. So in fact, um, the Imperial College site that we're going to take into, the expanded site, that's currently a sink. Um, but Warren Farm itself isn't. Um, however, like I say, uh, in tandem with the feasibility plan and then moving forward uh, to any particular proposal that might be on the table, we will look at doing um, an ecological assessment of the site as you normally would um, with any decision of that type. Um, in terms of the budget, um, the budget is, is literally just to start the ball rolling, as it were. It's to look at the feasibility plan um, and work around that. So we're confident that that budget is sufficient for this next step um but then we'll obviously look at it again depending on what the feasibility study uh comes up with and what proposals are on the table um i think your final question then was about the imperial college land um so we uh negotiate with with imperial college we spoke we went to them and asked them um if they would be interested uh, in being involved with our plans for Warren Farm playing fields. And they were very interested on the proviso that it was a rewilding initiative. That's what they want to be involved in. They want to be involved in a rewilding initiative. That's really important to them. And it's their land. It's not our land. It belongs to them. So they really get to decide um, how it's used. But they have given it to us on a 99-year management lease for free, we don't have to pay a penny. Um, so really, um, you know, they are doing a huge favor to the people of Ealing um, by giving us that land and allowing us to include it in our rewilding plans. And I think that, you know, we really ought to thank Imperial for that. Um, I think that's a great gift to the people of the Ealing. Uh, and I'm really delighted um, that they were so enthused by our plans that they wanted um, to, to work with us and give us that land for 99 years. Thank you. Uh, I have four more speakers and then we're going to come to the summing up. So we've got Councillor Ty next. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks to all our speakers. Um, and I know a lot of us have had lots of emails in our inbox and I know that um, I've also met with the Hanwell Village Green Conservation Area um, Residents Association who also made a lot of impassioned views and, and I know people come from a really genuine place of sincerely caring about the future and how we shape it. So um, in the um, actually, in the previous question, uh, Councillor Driscoll asked one of the questions I was going to ask uh, Councillor Costigan just about the location of Imperial College and the discussions there uh, when the 29 other sites were, were looked at, but that one's already been addressed. I guess an issue that has also um, cropped up a few times is just in relation to transport links to the area. And I just wanted to um, ask, had there been like discussions about, um, you know, exploring transport links? As was cited at the start, this is, you know, we're looking at the proposals and plans here tonight, but just have there been discussions so far on transport links or are there discussions um, intended around those transport links? Thank you, Chair. That's, that's good. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, so, uh, as I've said, at this point, we're talking about a feasibility. Um, so part of the feasibility would be considering issues like transport, for example. However, I should say, um, that previously, 10 years ago, uh, this site was the most used um, sports site in the borough. 
Um, and at that time, people got to it, whether it was, you know, by various different uh, modes of transportation. Um, so it is a site um, that people can reach that has been proved in the past. Um, there's a photo in the um, the additional report that is provided as a, a response to the call in that shows how worn the pitches were. Um, so that does demonstrate how well used it was uh, and people managed to get there. Um, however, we will look in detail um, at the next stage, you know, if there are proposals on the table to be looked at, um, then we will look in detail at, you know, how we encourage active travel, um, potentially looking at cycle routes to the site and different ways of getting there. But that's all kind of, as I say, the next stage um, in looking at this. But there is a precedence in the past. Um, it has been a well-used site and people use various modes to get there very, very successfully. Chief Councillor Brett, next. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, I know that you've mentioned it and you've probably um, touched on it many times around the feasibility study. Um, and kind of the, the timelines of next steps, but also um, if the feasibility study comes back and it isn't um, as favorable um, on uh, the current plans as they stand, um, what the process is um, going forward from there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Brett. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of, the, you know, as you say, the point of the feasibility, we will look at, you know, is this something that stacks up? Um, is it something that could be funded? Uh, is it something that we can um, make work? That's going to be part of what the feasibility study will look at. Um, I guess decisions like this, you, you take them in stages um, because you want to make sure at every step of the way that it is the correct decision. Um, and that's why it's kind of broken up like this. So we don't go in and you know just decide we're going to do something. We actually take it bit by bit. Uh, and we look at, you know, first of all, what, what kind of ideas do we have? And we're sort of at that stage right now. Um, and then secondly, let's test those ideas. Let's do the feasibility. See, did they work? See um, how much money they would cost? See where that funding would come from. And then you move to the next stage of actually looking at, um, you know, real life proposals, concrete proposals. Um, and, and that's the point at which then you look at, OK, you know, what might the impact be? How do we reduce that impact um, of the different proposals? Um, what we've outlined in the report in terms of the um, the, the playing pitches uh, is really the maximum um, we would like to see on the site. So it might be um, that we find out through the feasibility that, you know, it's you can make it work with less on the site. Um, that might be the case. And we might have, um, you know, people coming forward saying, you know, we could do it, we could make it work with less on the site, um, a different configuration. You know, we'll have to wait and see um, what proposals come forward. Um, but they are all at that future stage once we've done the feasibility. Um, but at the same time, as I say, we will move forward with making 62% of the land into a nature reserve, and we'll do that in parallel. Thank you. Councillor Summers. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I'm very uh, aware that this we're only talking about a feasibility study. It's, it's not a planning committee. Um, as I remember being on the, the original planning committee where the QPR... Um, you know, proposal was proved, and that was massive in comparison to to what is being suggested. Um, can I just ask about the you, you, the number of football pitches? And going back to I think it was 2010, 2012, when it became disused. Um, how many pitches were there at that point? And um, you said it was it was very very well used. Um, were they presumably they were all mainly used at weekends? Um, or was it was there week weekday football matches or? Um, Councillor, it is in the report, and I'm uh, but I'm trying to find where it is because I recall underlying it earlier today because I thought someone's bound to ask, ask me that question. Um, so thank you to my ward colleague for asking exactly the question. Um, but um, uh, Chris beside me, the officer, uh, has just uh, told me that it was actually. 18 football um, pitches and seven uh, cricket pitches. There was also uh, other facilities on the site as well, including like a, a, a long jump. Um, you know, I think there was uh, kind of squash, various other facilities on the site too, um, but 18 football and seven cricket so that you can see that what we are looking at as the maximum we would want to see on the site is far less 
um, than what was on previously and far less um, than proposals 10 years ago as well. It is a much smaller use of the site um, for playing fields. Um, however, you know, for us, it's about it's about the balance, isn't it? We want to make sure um, that the majority of the site is nature reserve, but we also want to ensure that we're catering to that need for playing fields in the South Hall area, um, but to a lesser extent than previously the site was used for. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. So we, we were talking, those were pitches were largely weekend use. There was no evening use. There's there's no proposed floodlights or anything like that evening. So um, I think most pitches in the borough, a lot of pitches in the borough will also be used um, for, you know, some squad training during the evening as well. And, you know, kids pitches during the evening. Um, so it's a they're most heavily used at the weekends. And that's where we find the biggest issue with capacity is. Um, so, you know, when I said that there's some clubs that are having to use pitches outside of the borough, um, a lot of that is at weekends. Um, so that's where the biggest use is, but it is also during the week. In terms of flood lighting, like I say, we've got no proposals on the table right now. Um, that, you know, uh, those kind of issues would be looked at if we got to the next stage in terms of specific proposals. Um, really, what we're just looking at now is what possible configurations might look like. Um, but, you know, I would also say um, where we have got flood lighting in the borough, um, you know, technology has changed a lot, even our own street lights. Um, there has been you know, like a real change in the spill that you get from lighting. In fact, you know, often you get the opposite complaint with people saying that um, those kind of lights don't shed enough light. Um, that tends to be what we get. Um, so floodlights are a lot different to what they used to be back in the day. But, you know, as I say, at this point in time, there is no actual proposal on the table. Um, the proposal that we've got, um, the proposals will come forward in the future where we would look at those, those kind of issues. Thank you. So I have uh, Councillor Ball wanted a second question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so for, for Dr. Spencer and Dr. McCormack, so in your expert opinions, does the area at the heart of Warren Farm, which is proposed to be uh, turned over to pitches, meet the criteria to be a sink? Uh, and if the scheme goes ahead as proposed, um, with so would the remaining area without that part um, would that be signed off by Natural England uh, as a nature reserve? Um, if I may start on the first part, I think actually following along from Ecology Consultancy's own recommendations to the council in 2018, I would say most certainly it does, because as they said, which appears to support acid grass would increase the boundary of the existing sinks to include that area. That core area where the council are proposing to put the sport pitches is, is where the acid grassland is, which is a UK priority habitat, section 41, as are at least one of the rarest plant species, section 41. It will result in the extinction of that species in that area and probably several others and is likely to cause the extinction of other organisms. So yes, absolutely, it would qualify. The data has been worked through. The Ecology Consultancy is a very, very reputable company. They work to national guidelines around how phase one habitat surveys are done, which is how sinks are done, and they collect dominant species data. So they identified there was, even when it was in not good condition all those years ago, that there was acid grassland there. Those pitches will destroy that habitat. Yeah, I would agree that um, what's currently there would qualify for a sink, um, and it is the main area where the skylarks are breeding. So the footprint in the proposals that were put forward at the cabinet meeting are actually on one of the most important sites on Warren Farm itself. I think it's important to say as well that Jubilee Meadow, Trumpers Field, Blackberry Corner, there are three fields that are currently in existence and don't have the same biodiversity value as Warren Farm. They're on the opposite side of the railway line. Making them part of the compensation does not compensate for the loss of, thir of over 50, almost 50% 50 of Warren Farm. So the rep repetition of 62%, 62%, 62% is a little bit disingenuous in my opinion. 
Um, it's the expanded site, including Imperial College Field, which is currently horse paddocks grazed down to millimetres. They don't have the same biodiversity value. And the thing is, we don't know what they will look like in 14 years time. And will they have compensated for what's lost on the current Warren Farm rewilded site? Uh, yeah, so I had a, a, another question for Councillor Costigan as well. Um, what, what and, and potentially for officers, uh, what would be the likely cost to council taxpayers of a, a judicial review if it um, if one was brought on this scheme as it was on the QPR scheme previously? Councillor Costigan. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm not, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, it's not something that I have been involved in previously, um, but I would suggest um, that if people have the best interests of Ealing residents at heart, including people in South Hall who uh, have the worst health outcomes in the entire borough, as well as people who want to see much of the site made into a nature reserve, then they would not want um, to uh, cost council taxpayers money um, by doing something such as that. However, of course, it's anybody's um, right to do so if they decided to do it. I'm confident in the decision um, and therefore um, I believe um, that it would be upheld. Um, we're going to, oh, Councillor Hashani next. And then one more question after that. Uh, thanks, Councillor uh, Costigan. Um, my question was really around the um, health inequalities in the area, which are obviously very vast. Um, in terms of uh, women using these football pitches, I know there's still a disparity between women and men using football pitches and cricket pitches. Um, so how can we ensure that actually inclusivity is really at the heart of this process? Um, and will you be um, thinking about that in the feasibility study about how we can get more a very inclusive inclusive diverse approach to who's using these pictures if they do go ahead thank you thank you councillor um so the the report um that was uh circulated as a response to the call-in does include quite a lot of information about what the uh sports governing bodies um are doing in relation to inclusivity um, the FA are doing a lot of work on women's football uh, and also um, both governing bodies are doing work on um, attracting um, people from Asian backgrounds to get involved in both of those sports. Um, I think uh, the work that we have already been doing as part of Let's Go South Hall um, is very important here. Uh, because what Let's Go South Hall ha has shown is that we are able to get, for example, um, women from Asian backgrounds um, to get involved in cycling if we do it in the right way. So it's all about taking that learning from Let's Go South Hall and we will ensure that we do that. Um, as I say, there's a lot in the report that goes into detail on how we intend to be as inclusive as possible in what we do, um, addressing that local need. Um, and so uh, that's going to be core um, learning from Let's Go South Hall. Councillor Young for its final question from him. Just wanted to ask Councillor Costigan what sort of partner, development partner, she envisages the council taking on um, you presume you have an idea because you're talking about advertising the opportunity next month and where you advertise the opportunity will depend on what sort of partner you're seeking to obtain. So it could be a commercial partner or it could be a community partner, but I don't think there are very many community clubs that would cope with this amount of expansion. Yeah. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, I there are a variety of different you know, kind of clubs that could be interested in an opportunity like this. And one of the examples of um, a, a um, charity organization that's running a really successful facility um, in Ealing at the moment um, is the Tigers, um, who are you know, very successful, do a lot of work um, in Ealing. Um, so that's one example um, that you might put forward. But of course, we're, you know, we, we'll have to wait and see what comes in. Um, we'll have to wait and see what comes forward. What we have, though, done is we've said that you know, the previous plans for the site 
are not something that we will be looking at um, this time around. We've made that clear with the, the line we've drawn around the area that we feel would be um, suitable for playing pitches. Um, we've done that purposely uh, in order to ensure um, that we're not attractive um, to perhaps some of the big clubs um, that were interested in this site in the past. We've purposely said we want a smaller, lower impact facility. Um, and it may well be that that's something, you know, a charitable organization or other is interested in. Um, but we'll wait to see what comes in. Um, what people um, uh, you know think could be provided on the site, um, but we're clear um, it's a maximum um, of thirty two percent of the site, um, and you know our configuration is um, included in the report. Um, we think that uh, it needs to have um, football and cricket overlaid one on top of the other, um, again to reduce. Um, the space taken up on the overall site. Um, this is doable because the cricket season and the football season are different. Um, so you can play one in summer and one over the winter months. So that reduces the amount of space that we need. And we're also clear that we'd like to see um, ancillary buildings um, moved to closer to the road. So again, they're sort of consolidated away from the, the kind of green open spaces on the site. At the moment, those dilapidated buildings that are currently on the site are in the middle. So we would want to um, consolidate that, as I say, towards the bottom of the site. So that we've sort of set out the parameters um, and within that, we'll see what comes forward. Um, but I think we've been quite clear um, that there are you know, specific kinds of bids that we would not want to say. Um, and we've got our red lines and they're quite clear in the report. So we've got Councillor Driscoll and Councillor Summers who both want us short questions. I'll ask them to ask their questions now. So and then Councillor. Uh, Coskin can answer both, and then no more questions. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to confirm, um, Councillor Costigan, in your answer to me about the feasibility, that would include habitat ecological assessment as part of the feasibility. And uh, to any of the other contributors here this evening, what's the technical name for a suitable uh, uh, um, ecological habitat assessment? Councillor Summers. Yeah, it was, it was a point of clarification with Dr. Spencer. You, you, the acid gra grassland you mentioned is specifically on the site of the formal football pitches. And so it, it's basically that, that acid gra grass has arrived since those pitches were stopped being used. Um, that is correct. So what often happens with grassland that has existed in the landscape for a very long time, when landscape use changes, um, such as amenity football pitch, because it was in the past described as amenity grassland. Many of the specialist species that are indicative or indicators of acid grassland become much, much rarer because it's much harder for them to live. Southern worm will survive as tiny fragments of individual growing plants. Many others will remain in, in the soil and will hold out, depending on their biology, for one decade, two decades, three decades. But there's there's only so long with the environment being hostile to that ecosystem that those species can survive, um, which is the core of the thing. We probably caught it just in time for those most endangered species because the rare clovers, the rare cops bindweed and several of the other species have only a certain amount of time in a seed bank. So the idea that you could remove that habitat and those plants go and hope that they may be somewhere else is a very high gamble to play with a plant species which is listed under the NERC Act section 41 you have legal responsibilities around this and the other species could very very well become extinct this is a very high risk gamble to take with things that you have a obligation under planning regulation and other pieces of national law and also the GLA's policies to ensure those species survive. They will become extinct if you proceed in this route. So, Councillor Costigan to answer Councillor Driscoll's question. 
thank you, Chair. Um, just in terms of uh, doing an ecological assessment, that would happen when we actually have a proposal on the table. You'd actually look at that proposal and see how it would impact ecologically. Um, and it is something that we have to do twice because you have to do it at different times of the year to make sure you take into account, you know, the different um, uses depending on the season. And, and what that would be called, which I think was your second question, is it's just called an ecological study or an ecological assessment. May I answer that just specifically about what it is actually called? There are two main forms, a phase one habitat survey or a phase two habitat survey. That is what they are. It's what the ecology consultancy did on behalf of the council in 2018, standard policy and procedure. Okay, so that was the last of the questions. So the next uh, step in the process is for the caller into Councillor Malcolm to sum up, and that'll be followed by Councillor Costigan, who'll sum up, and then we'll proceed to the debate. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I think as a duty, as a councillor, um, we need to listen to experts. We are councillors. We're not going to be experts in many of these areas that we come to, to pass. But we've heard two um, eloquent experts here, and we should listen to them because they know their business more than we do. There are a number of species that they quoted that will be lost, up to 20 species that have national and local and London-wide significance. We're, it looks like we're in breach of the uh, our own Biodiversity Action Plan the NERC Act and the SYNC review, which so far seems to have taken four years to get to the point where we are now, and it still hasn't been published when Richmond did it in two years. It's almost like we may be hiding some information in there that we don't wish to publish at this stage. Um, I think uh, Councillor Costigan talked about a red line. Well, she may have a different red line to me. Mine are that we should not be destroying habitat of up to 20 species. We've heard the evidence that is so clear and that's why I think we have to send this back to cabinet and make sure that they reverse these plans and leave Warren Farm as it is. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the reason for this decision, um, there, are there are a few different kind of limbs to the decision-making process. So, of course, the first issue um, that as a council we have to think about is our residents in the South Hall area of the borough have much worse health outcomes than the rest of the borough. And I said earlier that women in Norwood Green die on average 10 years and more than 10 years earlier than women in Northfields. So there's a significant difference. Um, we also know that there is a need um, through the sports strategy that we undertook last year, there is a need for up to 16 football pitches and four to six cricket pitches in the borough. So both of those things are really important. But added to that, we also, of course, want to make sure that we're delivering on our climate action priorities um, and looking at all three of those things together and looking at Warren Farm, we had this great opportunity with it, the Imperial uh, Fields land. We got offered this great opportunity to be able to add that land into the mix. And that then allowed us to bring forward a compromise, which allowed us to both deliver on our climate action priorities, making 62% of the expanded site into a nature reserve, and also delivering on the need for sport and the really, really acute need to address health inequalities in South Hall by also making 32% of the expanded site into playing fields. Now, I know that there are a number of people who feel that they won't be happy unless 100% of their priorities are achieved on this site. But as a local council elected by a cross section of the community in Ealing, we have to look at balancing the needs of all sections of the community. And that means as well as thinking of dog walkers, of people who enjoy nature, we also have to think of people who are dying 10 years early from not doing activity that allows them to address some of the health inequalities that we have got in this area of the borough. 
So taking all of those things into account, as a council, we looked at making that compromise of bringing forward something that would actually address all of those needs. But we managed to do something even better than a compromise. With the added site from Imperial College, we've actually got the best of both worlds. We have got that win-win that we never thought we'd achieve, but we do have in this proposal 62% a nature reserve. Um, like I say, I know some people don't want to compromise, and I understand um, where people feel strongly, and it's your democratic right to feel that and to come here tonight, and I totally respect that. But as a local council, we have to make sure that we try to look after as many people in the borough as possible. And I therefore um, ask the committee to uphold the decision of Cabinet in the interests of our borough. Thank you, Councillor Costigan. So what happens now, we go to debate, but we ask the members of the executive, so, so Councillor Costigan, to leave the room. I think I saw Councillor Anand at the back of the room, like He's also, <laughs> she needs to leave as well. And then as soon as they've left, we can start having the debate. So if anyone wants to put their hands up for questions, for contributions, then we'll crack on. Yeah. Uh, the, the members of the executive have to leave the meeting. I explained what the process, so just to, to hurl abuse at people leaving the room is completely inappropriate. Please desist from disrupting the meeting. That's Gosling, and thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're now going to proceed to the debate. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, can I just thank um, Dr. Spencer and Dr. McCormack for coming here this evening. And I would like to pay tribute to you in particular, Dr. McCormack, for the work you do with the Ealing Wildlife Group and the great contribution you, to, you make towards this borough. And I hope we can continue to build on that. Um, what I just will to say is I've only actually been to Warren Farm twice. And um, the first time would have been about five years ago when I was summer walk with my husband. Um, we saw how dilapidated it was there. We, we couldn't really understand what was really going on. We walked through fields, completely unaware at that time that there may well have been skylarks, there could well have been other activity going on there that we may have been disturbing. The second time I went there was as part of the site visit with my um, committee that I chair. I'm the, the scrutiny chair for, um, for Regrow, Rewild and Recycle. We went there as a site visit. And one thing that did come out of that is it was, it was explained um, that the skylights like a nice flat area of ground and they don't really want to have the disturbance of, of tall buildings or trees there. Now, that, the first thing that really came to my mind was thinking, well, there seems to be a little bit of a contradiction there um, because, uh, because we, want to, we want to plant more trees. We've got um, a place to plant more trees. Now, if we can't have so many trees, will that actually um, disadvantage other species, which, which actually does to me emphasize the fact that we need to really look at a balance between everyone and every species, people, animals, birds, everybody who might be using the space. Um, so, I mean, I'm not really going to buy too much into talking about deprivation here because it's only something that's mentioned in the report as a kind of, it's just simply implied in the report that there may be some help towards dealing with deprivation if we go ahead with these plans. So there's far more to it than that. What I will do is really look back to what I did say at the previous overview scrutiny committee, we were looked at this and, um, and how, what the, you know, how we looked at how um, the, the Asian population, for example, is growing in the borough. And there, there's a, be a huge demand for cricket pitches, for space, for people to play sport. Particularly, as I say, the Asian community really being very interested in playing cricket. And so that's something that I just really would like to think more about. And so something that I would like to do is that in that sense, I would like to make sure that we work together as a council. We work together with groups as yourself, with your expertise and make this plan work. We need to work together with the TFL as well. 
because we need to make sure the transport is going to be there to, because it's not 10 years ago now. It's not about cars driving there. We do need the public transport there. So I am hoping that we can work together and, and make this and make this work for that for the community that's, that's a growing Asian community that might want the cricket pitches that may well, if we don't, Put, if we don't put some proper plans in place, they are going to play on the pitches anyway and cause disturbance like my husband and I probably did that time. So that's why in my committee, I did say I wanted to have proper signage, proper paths, proper uh, proper infrastructure there to make sure that we don't cause disturbances. So that's what we need to do. As I say, work together, make it work so we can have sports facilities, so we can have nature reserve, that we can have the public transport. So please do. Uh, I, I'm, I'm upholding this and I just will appeal that hopefully you can stay on board with us once this all goes through. Thank you. Councillor Ball. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, one of the best things that the scrutiny process can do is listen to expert evidence and allow it to inform the council's policy making. So we have tonight heard from experts, from nationally renowned experts on botany and wildlife who've told us that the proposal. Uh, but the proposal that the cabinet uh, agreed would destroy the habitats of key species of flora and fauna and the rare acid grassland environment itself that's formed in the heart of Warren Farm. So it, it's not about percentages, uh, it's about protecting the most ecologically important part of the site and the key uh, rare species that are at risk of extinction. It's about forming a nature reserve of London-wide importance that would be a huge rewilding achievement for this council. So the, the, the current proposal, the current proposal is not a win-win because the proposed pitches would destroy the value of the nature reserve that they're seeking to create. Um, so I, I think I think it's clear that we need to send this back to cabinet to look at making the whole expanded site a nature reserve and pursuing additional sports pitches on other sites. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Um, thank you. Lots of points raised. Um, to give, I can answer some questions. Um, Councillor Summers asked about the use of that pitch formally. It was a place that all schools as far as Westminster use as their school sports pitches, and they, you'd see 20 minibuses up on the platform there. It was well used. And that answers, Councillor Rice said she went there. She wasn't sure what was going on. What's going on there is a disused site. It's disused. Um, now, however, however, um, it's a disused site. I'm aware of the walk. Thank you. It's disused. I understand the dog walking. My father used to walk from Croft Gardens to the Hare and Hound pub. And my mum used to pick him up. My late father. I know exactly what you mean by dog walkers. I understand that. I understand the site. Most people in this room do understand the site. Okay? But it's about balance. It's about balance. It is a designated sports ground, and we're looking at feasibly creating the sports space again, feasibly, feasibly, okay? It may not be feasible. We may not get the partners through. I believe we will, because there is a shortage of sporting space in the borough. Notwithstanding all the stuff we've heard today about inequalities, particularly in Southall, with, with women's sport, with disabled sport, I had a conversation with a club secretary on Friday, and, and this will probably come across your desk, um, Chris Bunting, quite soon. He cannot find a place to play cricket this year. So that, that, that's, a, that's a reality. Okay, Of course, that's just an anecdote. That's just something I'm telling you here. But I'm here because of people making representations to me. So we have a whole host of things. It's it is it's almost like that place become a victim of its own success. Um, there's a whole thing about biodiversity, and I do accept much of what has been said. I do, but it's about balance for the community, and I cannot see any reason why we cannot continue with a feasibility study. 
Um, so I have no reason to send this back to cabinet. So I wish to up, you know, I am um, to uphold this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clare. Councillor Summers next. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I wanted to make three uh, points. Um, firstly, the, on the question of judicial review, I, I just that that really irks me. The fact that um, Councillor Malcolm, I think it was, who said, you know, that you know how much money is going to be spent on judicial review and what could, else could it be for? That is the, not the way to formulate policy. There's not the way to formulate policy because oh no, we could have a judicial review and it will cost too much. We better not do that. You know, if we believe it is something is right, we should do it. Uh, for example, the, you know, the um, buffer zone around the um, the abortion uh, clinic, you know, that um, there could have been a judicial review of that. I think there was actually. Um, that's not a reason to say we're not going to do that. It's too, you know, we're too scared of the legal costs. So that is absolute nonsense. Secondly, um, this, as Councillor Kelly said, this is, this is a disused sports ground. It was a sports ground for 50 years. It was built, those... Um, uh, sports pavilion was built in the 1960s uh so miraculously this acid grass survived for five decades um underneath it and 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 i also don't buy the fact that you know you can't build you can't do uh reuse resurrect uh sports pitches um once you know you've got some wildlife living on there i mean in my ward uh lord Horsbury playing fields the uh, sports pavilion there mysteriously burnt down uh, about five or six years ago, you know, seven or eight years ago. Um, now, the council could have just said, oh, we can't afford to rebuild that. We'll just let the whole area become uh, disused. No doubt somebody would have found some uh, acid grassland and would have said, oh, you can't, you, you know, this is a vital wildlife site. You can't rebuild it. But they didn't. The, the council put the money in to help rebuild. Larkspur Rovers is now thriving football um football club for the community and loads and loads of uh, children you know uh, and young people run around and get really vital exercise um and th that that can happen at warren farm as well and uh, just a third point on the the, the social need for playing fields when, when we've heard a lot about it especially about southall um young people and especially women's football, women's sports in particular. I mean, we saw last uh, summer, the Euro 2022, um, the massive impact that had on, on young uh, women and girls. And it, we, you, haven't even seen, you haven't even seen the start of that. I mean, there's going to be an enormous demand for women's football, women's football pitches, young, young female footballers. And we, we need to you know, find somewhere for that to happen. And Warren Farm is the perfect site. And that it can happen quite in harmony with a a, a, a wildlife reserve res around it. I don't see that that, that it's it's going to be a bad neighbour. So okay, I'll be shouted down. But I've made my points. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, but I, I pretty much uh, come to a full stop. But I, I, I echo um, a lot of Councillor Kelly's remarks. Councillor Young. Thank you, Chair. Can I deal first of all with this question of health outcomes in Southall, which I acknowledge I'm not quite poor, but I can't see the providing pitches for groups of 22 young, fit and active players is going to improve the health outcomes of people in Southall more than providing a, a facility for nature lovers and dog walkers who will be of all ages and of all backgrounds. When I was first elected some four to five years ago, I campaigned on providing a nature reserve in my then ward in Greenford, the Lytton Nature Reserve. Never once have I regretted that formation. That is a, that is a piece of open land in built up area, which is much used by local schools and provides a much needed resource for local habitat. I would have thought that creating a proper nature reserve here would be a wonderful, wonderful resource for the borough. And it would be a London wide importance. It would be something, it would be a jewel in our crown, it would be something to be proud of. What the argument hasn't answered here 
is what is written in the report, in our own report, paragraph 414, which is the question of the acid grassland and the loss of the habitat to the skylarks. Taking out that 38%, to the balance of the 62% that is left, will destroy that vital habitat. And that has not been answered in any of the things that have been said today. Why should we lose that habitat, lose the livelihood of the, the, uh, the skylarks? It will be damaged, it will be irretrievably lost. And that has not been answered, and I don't think it has, will be. Thank you. Council Corporate. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So I, I think this is actually really difficult um, because the Council passed a climate emergency strategy unanimously, I think, a few years ago. And, you know, I intend to keep to the, commit, to the commitments that we made to the people of Ealing, recognising the climate emergency, recognising the importance of uh, biodiversity, recognising the importance of the environment. I, and, I, and I do believe we, ha we had a very good debate that night that listed the importance of why that's important and for the young people of this borough to have a planet and, and an environment to enjoy for centuries to, to come. Um, I don't like the idea that this, these proposals are a win-win. Um, I don't think they are because in the, I referenced earlier that I, I sat on the, and there are many people in the room um, who also sat on that regulatory committee um, and pre forerunners of that regulatory committee 10 years ago examining the proposals brought forward by Queen's Park Rangers as the major partner for the, for the previous um, proposals. Uh, I do think we, does it, we should congratulate the uh, Dr. Spencer, um, Dr. McCormack, and the and the um, the campaigners and, and environmentalists who've recognised who've taken the time to record what has been a change in the status of Warren Farm, the environmental status of Warren Farm. I think it is important that we do that as a local community. Why I dislike the idea that it's a win-win is because Warren Farm is a sports ground. It may not be a sports ground at present. It's historically a sports ground. Let's just illustrate the importance of that. Two former England male football captains, Les Ferdinand and Glenn Hoddle, played at Warren Farm in their formative years as footballers. They both have an intrinsic value and, imp and attribute importance um, to, to grassroots um, football. But I recognise for the people who've got, come to love Warren Farm as what it is today, right? It's a huge loss because you're looking at currently no sporting provision being on that site and you've been become used to that. And it will, any proposal to bring, bring, bring back sporting provision on this site will endanger what Dr. McCormack, Dr. Spencer and, and the residents of Ealing who've written to us and communicated this, you know, it will harm what is there, right? So the idea that we can sort of half and half it and nobody's going to be upset is for the birds, frankly. But, but I, and I, I find it very difficult as someone who benefited from sports provision in a mainstream school environment that is no longer available to the young people of Ealing to sit here and go entirely down the line that our environmentalist colleagues were. I'm an environmentalist. I want to protect nature. The problem is, we, you know, the councils all across the country and the government, frankly, have not done enough to protect nature in the preceding 50 or 60 years. That's why we're in a climate emergency, right? What, but one of the problems that we've had over the last, you know, specifically over the last 13 years, we've lost 45% of sports pitches, school sports pitches, school sports provision in London, just in London since 2010. And when Councillor Malcolm and Councillor Ball and Councillor Young want to cosplay as environmentalists and cosplay as people who think that, you know, sporting provision can be provided elsewhere, I want to ask them, why did you not protest to Mr Gove when his first decision as Education Secretary of the Coalition Government was to cut the school sports project in Southall, in Ealing, in Northall, in Perivale, in Hanwell, in Elthorne and in Acton, because you decimated the school sports strategy and the provision of local school sports. Chair, I've spoke, I just want to finish on two points because it would be remiss of me, Councillor Young has just mentioned health inequality. I sit on this panel as the Chair of the, the, the Council's Health scrutiny panel. Health inequality is important. I agree with Councillor Young that we're not going to miraculously solve 
the health deprivation of Southall by providing some sports pitches on Warren Farm. You know, that's absolutely correct. But we should start to redress the historical imbalance of sporting provision that nowadays in, in, in 2023, you either pay to play sport in private facilities in Ealing, or we take a decision like we have at Rectory Park, like we have at North Alla, like we have in various in North Acton playing fields in my own ward to provide pitches and make them accessible. And it is not, and there's a key distinction between this proposal, which is let's let's be clear about what we're deciding tonight. We are not the planning committee. I respect what um, our experts, and I will call them experts, in, in the although we're not supposed to listen to experts anymore. People have had enough of experts in this country. But I respect the expertise of the two gentlemen we've heard from this evening. I do not believe they're wrong. I believe they're absolutely right. And it is important to say that, right? Um, but we, we've not heard from anybody from Sport England. Mr Bunting was one of the directors of our uh, assistant directors of our sports facilities in this borough, was not asked a single question by a member of the committee. I respect Dr McCormack saying that na natural England, nature England, England nature, whatever they're called these days, forgive me, because um, they've been through some rebrandings, would, would object to these proposals when they come forward. But if we were to go the other route, the 100%, um, environmental route for shorthand, if you'll forgive me, Sport England would object on the same basis because it is a sporting site that needs to be maximised in accordance with the sports strategy. Now, how do you balance those? You can't. And I will just, yeah, I'll come to thank you, Chair. Um, the, 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 fun, the fundamental decision that we're taking tonight, we're not the planning committee, we're not going to approve proposals this evening. We're proposing a feasibility study. And the beauty of a feasibility study is it depends on meeting the environmental test, which is laid out for us expertly this evening, meeting the sporting test, which I think we've spoken about at length, but also meeting the financial test. Are any of these proposals viable? Can we find partners to build on, build on this site? Can we do it for value for money? I, I don't know whether we can. So... But but I'm willing to see whether there's a feasibility whether there's a feasibility study. If there isn't, the whole thing falls apart. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Final contributions, Councillor Driscoll. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just to go through some of the grounds for the calling. Um, I mean, one of the issues was relating to Southall and health outcomes. Well, it was said at the actual cabinet meeting about the disparity in health outcomes in Southall compared to other parts of the borough. Um, I represent Northfields, which is a light uh, distance, of light, light years away in Northfields in terms of how health outcomes An award that actually benefits from a multi, multi, multi million pound investment in sports facilities within walking distance and multiple green spaces easily from all uh, directions around the ward and within the ward. Um, and also as a, a school governor for the past five years at a primary school in South Hall, where we do, where childhood obesity is an issue that is monitored and steps are taken. So the issues of health disparity are real, are tangible and are well documented. The fact that you would say at a football pitch will mean that we lose certain, have so many beneficial impact in a certain percentage on a certain outcome would be hard to quantify but we cannot deny that there are disparities in health provisions and we should be focused upon that. Um, so I think that the calling on that basis needs to be rejected on the health issue. The consultation aspect, yes, I think we need to be really per, really conscious about how we do do consultations going forward. And especially when it comes to South Hall, it's one of the areas which contributes less to consultation than many other areas. So we need to make sure that we do include actively and take steps to make um, Con participation in consultations much more easy, much easier for those residents in Southall. Uh, corporate strategy, yeah, there, is, there are problems, there are problems with planning issues, um, but this isn't part of just a single policy issue here. Um, in terms of bi biodiversity, in terms of rewilding, it's one part of a wider strategy which will feed out over the years that come. So it's one part of it, it's not the only thing. Uh, the alternative playing fields, I mean, it's been said, um, I mean, some of the alternatives are in are closer to Hangar Lane Tube or on the edge of Hillingdon. And if you said to somebody in South Hall, we'll travel all that way so you can get an alternative playing field, it wouldn't be very impressive. Um, and the supplementary uh, documents that go with the agenda, they're on the public website now, 
outline the problems with the alternative sites. So you can't just say there's seven sites that will do. Um, the issue of um, uh, calling in, which I think does have ground and does have merit, is regarding the actual background and detail in terms of the habitat and the studies that have been done there. So we've heard tonight that the sink reviews are uh, for the northern part, the imperial land, a thread in between on the Hedgegrove and down to the Earl of Jersey's land. And that work has not been undertaken to use a sink study for the rest of Warren Farm. Um, we've had an out of date study when QPR was going for a work there. So that's no longer reliable. I think that's widely recognized. I, I welcome Councillor Costigan's confirmation that an ecological assessment um, should be understand, undertaken as part of the feasibility study. I worry about the sequencing, because if we do a whole lot of wood and what work on what sports should go in there, but don't have to know where we're going to put them because of the impact that we have, then I do worry about that sequencing. Um, the, the use of imperial land, and this format is probably not the best format to discuss uh, negotiations of land ownership in London, which by its very nature would probably be commercially sensitive and not best done in this format. But I do think there's merits to revisiting that and explain if we've got the evidence to show imperial that we have a certain land of a certain value, then I think we might have a different type of discussion with imperial. Um, just closing, I would like to give notice of two recommendations that we should consider. Um, and one is that we should recommend it, recommend that we authorise the strategic director of um, sustainability, forget if I'm going to get the, the time right, <laughs> um, to, or part, as part of the feasibility, undertake a suitable habitat survey of the Warren Farm area and the Imperial Land, Imperial College Land area. Um, whether we call it phase one or phase two, I will leave other people to determine that. Uh, but we understand a study there. And I should also think my other recommendation is that we ask Cabinet to reconsider the discussions with Imperial about the use of their land once we're informed by the habitat survey and asses assessment. There's my two recommendations. May I just address one quick point of accuracy? Okay. We're doing it anyway. Okay, thank you. That's, that's just... um, I mean, just we maybe look at something a bit more imaginative, whether it's a land swap. So they do get their rewilded land and we take over theirs for sports facilities. We can be imaginative about it. I don't think we should enter that discussion in particular in details here and now, but maybe that we have a consideration. I don't know whether that's possible, whether it's feasible, but I flag it up as an option. OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have a new the final contribution. Awesome. And I'm going to be brief. Some of my councillor colleagues have, have been less so. I live near Warren Farm. I use Warren Farm. I love Warren Farm. Um, it's a really, really important part of our community. Um, it is, uh, particularly through COVID, people discovered it in ways that, that, that people barely knew it was there. And it has become a really, really important part of our community. But I would say that I, uh, and I, I share Councillor Young's point there, I would love to be part of a team that makes that a local nature reserve. And we can go ahead and do that. 
over the overwhelming majority of the site um, in the coming months or, or how long, however long that takes. Um, but I do think, and I'm not going to rehash them, moving uh, the, the existing hard standing, the car parking, the hideous derelict buildings, and having a, a feasibility study that looks at some low impact sport nearer the road is not going to endanger all of the brilliant work um, that Katie and the team have done to bring this to the public attention um, and to make sure that we do focus on the ecological value of the site, which is which is a really incredible achievement. So um, I'm not I'm going to try and avoid the win win uh, words, which have probably been over um, over over bandied around. But I it, it, we can make this great. We can make a really fantastic local nature reserve. And we can put a few flame playing pictures in there too. I really think if we get together, we'll do something amazing. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lisa. Thank you, everybody, for their for the questions and contributions. Thank you to uh, everybody who's here. So we need to make a decision, and, and the basic two options are either to refer this back to cabinet or to uphold the uh, cabinet decision, and we can do so with or without Councillor Driscoll's suggested recommendations. Listening to everybody's contributions, I got the sense that there was appetite for going ahead with the feasibility study. Um, so I'm going to propose that we uphold the decision, and but we also take into account council and um, we support council discourse two recommendations. So on that basis, does everybody agree? We have to go to the vote for this. Sorry, Councillor Kelly, point of information. Sorry, but there is. If we didn't agree with those recommendations, we're we entitled to vote on that as well. Yes, we can, we can take them separately. Fine. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll first of all go with the decision to uphold or send back to cabinet, and then we'll talk about the recommendations. So I'm going to propose that we uphold the cabinet decision. Is that agreed? Then we can vote, please. And anybody against? I don't think that's carried. So the decision is to uphold the cabinet decision and now we're going to talk about councillor uh driscoll's recommendations mm -hmm. to uh go for us uh, the habitat survey and then the second recommendation was to the, the conversation with imperial college so on the first point the habitat survey we don't, everyone heard the wording that councillor um, driscoll suggested it's uh, the committee minded to support that yeah that's unanimous thank you and then the second one was then the Follow up the discussion or the conversation with Imperial College, however that can look like, like which might be a little bit difficult, but to revisit the relationship with Imperial College. I'm going to propose that. We minded to support that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, those against? Abstentions? That's okay. Okay. So that's carried as well. So we'll 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 go ahead with both your recommendations. So that's now the end of the call-in item. Thank you very much, everybody. We now have members of the uh, public are welcome to stay for the budget consideration, probably the most important and critical decision we make in the municipal year. You are welcome to stay or, or you can leave. Yeah. We'll have two minute comfort break then.
It is. It is a bit steam. Councillor Donnelly, Councillor Donnelly, are you going to introduce the budget or are we going straight? With we uh, I, I will speak to the first slide or two, and then the more technical aspects the officers will will work through. Uh, but I, I reserve the right to chip in from time to time and, 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 and answer in a helpful way, obviously. First of all, let's say thank you for waiting so long. The, the debate obviously was quite a lengthy one and went on a little bit longer than we'd have anticipated, but it, that's the way it goes. Um, let us know when you're ready and when we can start. I tried. <laughs> We're good. Okay, so thank you, everybody. We're ready for the next item, which is the review uh, of the budget, which is going to cabinet tomorrow. And um, we've got a slide presentation, which we have all received, but I think it's on the monitor screens as well. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Shimana, I think, or Emily, or Steve. If I can introduce it. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for staying, I suppose I should. I, I should say well, I'm I'm aware I, I caught some of the um, some of the previous debates, so I know you've already had a very busy uh, evening. I, I'm Councillor Steve Donnelly. I'm the cabinet member for uh, Inclusive uh, Economy. Uh, with me are uh, Emily Hill, who is our Strategic Director for Resources, and Shabana Kosa, who is the Assistant Director for Strategic Finance. Uh, both of whom. There is there was a little bit of echo when the chair was speaking before as well. So whether somebody is live on the meeting with their uh, but without their um, speaker or microphone, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, so I think we'll we'll try to be brief. Uh, this evening's not not really um, in, in the budget briefing. Not night for this was part of both grand standing. We have. Uh, everyone here will have an opportunity to um, have their say 
in a political context when we come to the full council meeting. Um, and obviously my cabinet colleagues will have the opportunity to make their contributions tomorrow evening. Uh, so in terms of the, the slide that is before you, I mean, really just put it in context. We've had some very odd, very difficult, uh, bless you, Coastal. We've had some very odd, very difficult years in the last decade, decade uh, and a half, in the last five or six years in particular. But this year has been, by any standards, uh, an extraordinarily um, difficult roller coaster. Uh, a year uh, of three prime ministers, of a near economic meltdown. Um, members of the of my own group will know from um, conversations I've had with them that at various points I felt uh, mildly optimistic that things might not be too bad, then a bit pessimistic. But then at times in September, I, I think I and colleagues were genuinely fearful about the prospects for uh, the Ealing economy, for the citizens of Ealing, uh, when absolutely out of nowhere, the then recently appointed and soon to be unappointed Prime Minister uh, Liz Truss and the Chancellor immolated the, the, the British economy on a wholly voluntary uh, basis. And things looked, things looked grim, to be, to be perfectly honest. Uh, now, the, things moved very, 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 very fast. Um, and by the time we got to the draft local government settlement in December, which was updated, and what you have in front of you was has been updated to include the final uh, settlement, uh, we had a much more settled picture. Um, and people will talk you through it. Um, we know the pressures we still face from social care. Uh, as a provider of social care, uh, we, we have been run ragged almost, trying to keep pace with the increase in demand, not just in numbers of people seeking social care from us, but in the expectations, rightly, that people have in what we deliver. It becomes more expensive. I know our partners within the health service face exactly the same challenges. We can do more and better, and people therefore expect that we will. So we continue to prioritise um, and protect the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, in assessing how we move forward on council tax and the, the potential for a social care precept, we had to assess it um, as an economic citizen uh, the same as an individual, our costs have been escalating hand over fist. The cost of living crisis, the rising cost, the rising rate of inflation. Uh, you have to be as old as me to remember when inflation was last at these levels. And the only responsible position we could take regarding council tax and the social care precept was to take the 2.99% rise in council tax that was available and the 2% social care precept. I say available, in reality, when you look at the government's modeling uh, of uh, local government finance, that 2.99% where, uh, and 2% for the precept where social care is provided are baked into the modeling that the government produces. So uh, we, are, we are simply passing on what the government requires us in effect to pass on. So at that point, I will pause. I believe we have from this produced uh, a sensible balanced budget, which seeks to address both the challenges we've just been through and the challenges that face us in the years to, in the year ahead and the years beyond that. So at that point, uh, I'll ask uh, Emily and Shabana to pick up the threads. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Donlin, who you chair. Thank you. Um, conscious that it's been a long evening for um, members of the committee and that you have had the presentation in advance. So I will try to go through at quite a pace, but Chair, you will stop me if you think I'm whizzing through it too quickly. And of course, I'll ask as many questions um, that, that arise at the end. 
So um, you, you have all seen and been referenced to the cabinet report and we'll focus today uh, therefore on um, the recommendations essentially that are, are being put to cabinet before going to full council. Um, so we're just, just conscious that that's not updating. Um, yes, the presentation's not updating. I don't know if you have members should have in front members should have a pack. So I'll move into the, the the page that talks about the introduction, really. So um, as Councillor Donnelly has said, we must set a robust and balanced budget uh, each year. And this report, the cabinet report that's proposed for cabinet does exactly that. Um, we receive late in each sort of calendar year, a provisional local government settlement, but the final finance settlement has now been published. And therefore the, the report um, before you does update that for the final settlement and brings forward the savings proposals um, and the income proposals that are required to balance the budget. Um, so, so cabinet will look to approve the general fund budget proposals before they move on uh, to full council at its statutory meeting on the 8th of March. Um, so some of the key areas really that we need to bring your attention to are the new savings proposals, um, the, our view of the medium term financial strategy, or at least our high level view of the direction of travel, but the medium term, um, the council tax increase that all, already been mentioned by Councillor Dunley, some updates on schools funding and also business rates. So, so I think uh, the next slide, which talks about the overview, probably um, we've covered most of that um, already. What we will do also is cover what is a statutory statement by the section 151 officer, which is the chief finance officer for the um, council on the adequacy of the reserves and the general fund balance. So the, the financial sustainability essentially of the council taking uh, due regard to the budget proposals um, in front of cabinet tomorrow. There are also some other statutory documents that need to be approved through, through cabinet and they, um, they are uh, within the documents. Uh, very few changes really to those, but we can pick, pick that up. Um, so probably sort of moving through the recommendations that are being put uh, to cabinet, we talk about um, balancing budget and this table um, that's just disappeared, but the table on the slide that you've got that says 23-24 budget process section 3.5, appendix one and appendix two, shows how um, in July, um, officers presented uh, the expected budget gap of 38 million. What's happened since then is officers have identified um, savings proposals of 7 million. But actually, whilst we'd expected 35 million pounds of growth in July due to inflation and demand, actually inflation and demand uh, has increased even further than we expected last summer because of the increase in inflation and the impact of cost of living and actually post-COVID on demand that we'd actually needed to create further growth or further expenditure commitments essentially, um, sort of widening the gap even further. Um, so, so as we come to close that gap, how, how does, does that work? Well, we, we expect to get circa 20 million, so that 19.920 additional grant for government. So expecting an understanding that there have been significant inflation, inflationary pressures and demand pressures, particularly in social care um, there. We then um, <coughs> have additional income assumptions from business rates and council tax. Now that's not the proposed increase in business rates and council tax, that is a increase to the base in council tax. So additional properties coming um, on board and some increases um, in business rates due to um, business rates revaluation. Um, then we've got the proposed um, increase to council tax, which is the eight million pounds there. And then also some other savings that we've identified from corporate items um, of about four and a half million, which brings us to uh, what we are required to do, which is a balanced budget for 23, 24. So that's sort of showing you at a high level how the gap that we came to in July then moves to a balanced budget position in 23, 24. 
a certain element of that is the savings that are required. <laughs> I would say that it is increasingly hard to identify significant savings after, as Councillor Donnelly said, over a decade of, of austerity and real terms funding cuts. Whilst we have seen some increases in recent years in funding, still in real terms, um, cuts. Uh, so it's increasingly difficult to do so. We have identified this year uh, 7 million, which will help to close the budget gap. <laughs> we talk also about those um, additional demand pressures. And so whilst we've provided growth to, to deal with those demand pressures, we've also got a number of activities that are required to be um, undertaken by the council, which are these cost avoidance savings, which have meant we've managed to limit as far as we've um, we've got a big figure and um, limit the growth request there by by three million so seven million is what we need to balance the budget that three million is essentially needed to manage demand so that we don't have sort of increased costs going up three million. <laughs> uh, quite a big table here so but this, the summary message on this really is this is showing the movements <coughs> in government grant funding and what you will really see, um, uh, the negatives in this case are sort of additional grants. So you normally see negatives as sort of reductions, but the negatives are additional grants, additional income, and then the positive figures are grant reductions. And what you see here as an overall message is government sort of reprofiling funding from uh, lower tier um, grants. So that means sort of universal services grants, environment services type grants. Um, redistributing it really into adult social care and social care so recognizing the market and the demand pressures in social care it's sort of reprofiled its its grant <coughs> into um into those areas uh, so overall an increase in of 20 million but you see almost all of that increase and, and that reprofiling into uh, social care um as cancer Donnelly has um, said the government has announced an increase of 9% in core spending power. So the government believes that local authorities have 9% more uh, spending power uh, than they did in previous years. And of course uh, they do, but what they do do is assume that councils will uh, levy the maximum council tax um, available. Um, so, so yes, we were, we were pleased. The settlement was certainly better than feared. It remains a one-year settlement, so we still have a high degree of uncertainty in the future, particularly with pending local government financing reform. So moving on to investment or growth, really it's been pretty difficult um, to set a balanced budget. You will have seen um, in sort of our in-year reporting, experiencing significant pressures, particularly in social care and particularly in adult social care, um, uh, both in terms of the market, the social care market um, being very challenging and needing to um, have increased costs and costs of um, residents coming out of hospital with much higher levels of need. So um, that coupled with very high levels of inflation that were actually um, not predicted at this time last year, as we set the 22-23 budget, um, has caused quite sort of significant pressures on the budget and, and has uh, very significant investment plans uh, or growth plans really um, in this year. You see on that graph there, the, um, the blue and the green uh, uh, pie, pieces of pie, um, being really quite sig significant. And that, that's because um, we, we, we expect high levels of inflation next year, but we also had to address sort of under being under providing inflation for this current year, because the levels of inflation were much higher um, than had been expected at budget setting. And you sort of see in the, the little graph in the corner next to it, how that sort of profile has changed. And you see really that that um, that impact this year of inflation and demand being much bigger than it has been in previous years. Um, some, also, some, some capital growth um, largely sort of uh, leisure parks sort of rolling programs rather than any significant um, 
one-off capital programs and of course there's a lot of commitments in the council plan which will need um capital investment and as those um detailed business cases are brought together and brought forward they'll be added in for the capital program uh, when they uh, have the detail available so whilst we set an annual budget we must try to well we must look at the sustainability of the council in the long term and that is very difficult with the fifth consecutive um annual uh settlement um and i think as we say here that we, we've got a settlement for one year uh, and whilst we can give some guesses for 24, uh, 25, it can only really provide a sort of indication at this point with us only knowing the provisional settlement again uh, towards the latter end of this calendar year. As to funding after 24, 25, there's even more uncertainty. We do not have a spending review at the moment and it will be a new parliament. So, so um, we do our best to, to make an educated guess, but I have to say that it is, isn't a lot more than that at this stage, and we have to plan uh, with the best, um, best assumptions that, that we can do. So financial resilience um, is important. We um, provide statutory services that our residents and, and that our residents rely on, so we have to be able to plan uh, and be clear that the organisation can manage in the long term without the need to go to government uh, with a begging bowl, seeking support or issuing quite drastic measures, as you may have seen in other local authorities like Croydon, which is issuing something like a Section 114 notice, which is essentially a freeze on, on all uh, unessential, unstatutory spend. So very keen that uh, Ealing absolutely doesn't get in that position and one of the ways to do that is to ensure that the council has sufficient reserves I think particularly in light of Covid where we saw sort of unprecedented and sort of unplannable financial pressure it's even more important in that light that that we um have sufficient reserves to be able to make what were frankly life and death decisions without having to worry whether we were able to do that is without making the council go bankrupt. So it's, so it's important to have a sufficient level of reserves. And SIPFA, which is the um, public finance um, accountancy institute, provides a financial resilience index, so a comparison of um, councils in their, their view of their resilience. You can see um, Ealing's uh, little sort of darker blue um, table there, sort of towards the lower end of the scale in SIPFA's review of resilience. I would say um, for committee members that weren't here last year, um, prior to that, we were much more to the right. So we have improved our position definitely in terms of financial resilience, but I think still some little way to go uh, to ensure we're sort of with um, the middle of the pack and sort of feeling comfortable that we can deal with significant shocks in the system, like 10% uh, inflation suddenly coming um, and hitting us. So, um, so, so, so the budget includes a contribution to reserves to try to improve that resilience. Uh, and that is one of the considerations in my statutory statement as to whether I believe that um, the reserves are sufficient to ensure financial resilience. So I think I've probably covered most of that slide um, as I talked, but it does give you the detail of those reserves. And while we have sort of other reserves available, the housing revenue account is ring fenced. The council taxpayer must not subsidise the rent payer, the tenant, as the tenant payer must not subsidise the council taxpayer. Uh, and similarly, schools are ring fenced and we cannot um, use those balances. Moving on then to fees and charges, um, uh, we, we charge fees and charges largely to recover our costs and with inflation being high and, and inflation increasing those costs, we've therefore proposed to increase fees and charges to match those. Um, in all cases, directors will ensure that an equality analysis assessment is undertaken as and before they implement the decision. 
there were some new fees and charges, and that is on the uh, next slide. Um, but otherwise, the sort of principles were an increase in line with inflation or an updated cost review. And uh, I'm sure members of the committee will be aware that we cannot raise parking charges for revenue generating purposes. They are to, um, uh, to if there was part of parking strategy and to, to, to influence parking behavior. So we wouldn't set that for revenue purposes, but we would, we would of course, if we assume uh, any particular change in enforcement activity would have to account for the change in income. I'll skip through that because I won't go through it on a line by line basis, but I'm sure uh, you've seen it, uh, which brings us to the council tax item. Um, and, and this is therefore showing if once, um, if full council were to approve those council tax increases, these would be uh, the council tax charges, which includes the GLA precept. Uh, they will meet on the 23rd of February. And once that is approved, uh, the, the, the full um, council tax will be agreed by our full council on the 8th of March. If there is any change, we will, uh, of course, update and table um, or even beforehand share um, the new rates. But it's not been done, to my knowledge, uh, since I've worked in local government. Um, so, so we we show you here what the proposed um, increases would be in terms of uh, pounds and pence. Um, I guess important to understand that you know a difficult decision for any council to increase um, council tax in the cost of living crisis. And the next slide, therefore does set out some of the mitigations really that support our residents that are would have the um, most concern and difficulty paying their council tax bills. Um, the council tax reduction scheme here at Ealing is already a very generous one. And there was a change in cabinet uh, that increased the, um, the support that we provide to those in the lowest income bands. Um, as well as changing that support, we also uprate the income bands. So the income bands have all increased by 10% uh, of CPI. So that will also bring more people uh, who haven't probably experienced the same uplift to their earnings into those lower bands. And, and finally, also the government announced some additional funding, I think also recognizing that their expectations were that councils increase council tax uh, by the maximum and therefore um, announced additional funding for council tax support. Um, it's, it's national scheme asked councils to provide um, a £25 payment uh, to anyone on council tax reduction uh, or council tax support. They can be used interchangeably and, and allowed um, councils discretion in determining what it would do with the remaining funding. Now, because the council here has a very generous scheme, we do have quite um, a lot of additional uh, remaining funding um, after the £25 that the government have asked us to do. So the council's increased that to £40 and we'll use the remaining funding to provide um, support in year for those people who weren't able to uh, make uh, benefit from the reduction on the 1st of April and to provide additional support to anyone who may have had the 40, but may still be struggling with their council tax bills. The next two I will just skip through, Chair, really, because they are the statutory um, strategies that we need in place, but there are no really uh, sort of significant issues to raise in terms of the changes from previous years. Um, and similarly, the final side on key updates uh, don't have any sort of significant uh, changes to previous years um, to say that the parking account you will all know is sort of it's not a stricter ring fence but we can only use surpluses for particular reasons and that surplus will therefore go into the parking reserve and the school's funding and budgets again is uh, very much ring fenced and allocated largely out directly to schools and agreed with the schools forum which I'm afraid I didn't get through quite as quickly as I'd hoped for you all, but I, I, I spoke as quickly as possible, uh, but happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Emily. You did really well on time. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, we will go to questions and please everybody, it's questions, not speeches. We've got time for speeches at full council. So technical or practical questions. So Councillor Crawford first. Yeah, yeah, go for it, Councillor. Thank you. Um, so one of the key decisions we have to take, as Councillor Donnelly and Emily have, have outlined already, is on um, council tax and that, that social care precept. Um, I mean, it's clear that social care is the key, uh, as the presentation identified, you know, half of the pound, every pound the council spends is spent on this area, and it's a growth area in terms of demand, if not in terms of um, resource for the local authority and I just wondered if we could have a sort of longer term it's very difficult clearly in the longer term view or what we do in respect of caring for a, a growing grain population the expectation that that's going to need you know the government's not going to meet our, our, our needs on that and and how we look to to do the best we can to innovate in that in that sector thank you uh, Thank you, Councillor Crawford. Um, just say it, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one partly because um, we've kind of been told to ride up the hill of social care reform more than once in the last three or four years. And it's only in the last few weeks that we've heard the most recent uh, attempt has, has been pulled. We know, therefore, there will be no significant reform of social care in this country, certainly in, in England, this side of the next general election, irrespective of when that will, will, will be. Uh, like all authorities, we spent time, effort and money in um, investigating how we would be impacted and how we would respond to the proposals that we thought were likely to emerge in terms of reform, um, that effort, that money um, is, is gone. Um, there has been a, a readjustment of budgets to reflect what wasn't given to us. Um, but nonetheless, I don't think anybody across local government, irrespective of political party, uh, believes that the current situation is either satisfactory or sustainable. Thank you, and, and thank you, Councillor Crawford. You're right that adult social care, particularly, is the sig single biggest sort of pressure uh, for us and the single biggest change, particularly coming out of COVID, seeing both increases um, in sort of the complexity of need as well as the number of people coming through the, the type of care that they need and and that so I I, I think um, you're right to ask us about and, and to challenge officers on having a medium and a longer term view of this uh, I would say it has it is and has been particularly hard in these last year two years particularly because of the impact of covid so we're currently still seeing the impact of the backlog coming through the NHS people coming out with higher needs earlier so it's quite it so any sort of transformation work that we do at the moment is really difficult because we're not in a day-to-day -day situation so I think we need to allow that to sort of settle a bit and then we need to come back on how do we um it's 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 a finance um this sort of ideal circumstances um in residential care we probably have the least best outcomes at the highest cost and so the the transformation and the view to try to move people from residential care into being supported within and by the community um means that you get better outcomes and that let at, at letter cost so there is more work to do there but currently with people coming through and being placed by nhs we've got we need to just take a bit of a pause at the moment to then come back and see when things settle and post that NHS backlog to know how we, we change and transform services. Um, How's that? Is that better? 
Jamie, try mine. Hang on. Oh. Tate, to have, I hate to censure it, would um, that thanks very much, um, Emily Shabana and Councillor Donnelly for, for the presentation. Um, I mean, word unprecedented gets thrown around all the time, um, but my understanding is there is an unprecedented item here with the council plan for real living wage. I, that's an item that didn't exist before. And I, I think it's really great. It recognises the dignity of labour in, in material terms. It's not an award or certificate at the end of the year. It's actually cash in people's pockets, um, notwithstanding the fact that that cash is going to be worth less in their pockets now than it would have been when we made that decision. Um, so I'm all for it, but I wouldn't mind knowing a bit more details about it, how many workers across the piece it will affect, what on average, how much they might get, um, but also how do we mitigate against that growth going up or growing, going through the roof? Um, if that question makes sense. Thank you. Well, again, if we, if we split it kind of politics and numbers, um, thank you. Um, you know, it, it's been uh, one of the key aspirations, policy objectives of the administration, uh, both before and after the last Ealing Council election to, to drive forward the real living wage agenda. Uh, I'm very pleased and proud that we now have uh, a close relationship with the Living Wage Foundation, uh, who were good enough to ask me to speak at one of their uh, online events only uh, last week. So, I mean, that, that's, I think that's a recognition of the work that, that we are doing. Um, we've audited all of our contracts. We've ensured that our contracts are now managed in a way that, will, that this will never slip off the, the radar. Uh, the big challenge for us uh, in the real living wage has, has always been care homes because we have an awful lot of care homes uh, in Ealing and other local authorities of similar size uh, and budget have hardly any. Um, so that, that creates a, a completely different... The, the domiciliary um, aspect, domiciliary care, we dealt with first um, and now we're driving through to deal with the issues in care homes. And this this is a kind of we pick these up as they as they come along. We make sure that as we renew our relationship with care homes, that they understand the need to do this. One of the one of the oddities of the high inflation burst was that actually um, it motivated some care homes of their own volition to start to pay more. So in with with the domiciliary angle, for example, we discovered that some of the some of the expenditure we expected from that didn't have to come from that fund because it moved into business as usual contracts. Um, doesn't mean to say we got it for free, but it came from it came from a different part of the uh, of of the budget. But it, the commitment to, to drive on and spend whatever is necessary to give a decent living income to the, the residents of, of the borough and, and frankly residents of other boroughs who work in our borough. Um, I, I think that will remain um, a key commitment of the of, of this administration. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Um, so, so I think I will need to come back to you on in terms of how many workers uh, and other things. So, so I, I will do that. We do have a detailed analysis, uh, particularly it was a large piece of work done on the home care market, as as Councillor Donnelly has said. So, so we've got detailed information on the cost of that um, real living wage uh, and how we've worked with the home care market on that, so which I I can come back to you on. Um, uh, I, I would say, um, you're right, it is a significant commitment. So there's 3 million in the 23-24 budget, but there's 2 million 
already in the 22-23. So, so it is five million on an ongoing basis. In terms of sort of your question on sort of how far does it keep increasing, Council Donnelly um, has has indicated and is quite correct that we've done the audit of all of uh, our contracts, and as contracts have come up. Uh, new contracts have come up, we've ensured that real living wages is part of that. So um, actually, in terms of the large contracts by the council, or even the sort of medium ones, um, we have th this budget now includes those last ones, which were included SEN transport uh, for 23-24 and um, the leisure contract in 23-24. So we believe that to be uh, pretty much all of the significant council spend areas which we will now have factored in to the budget you you are right in that it also creates an ongoing commitment because each year that real living wage will be um, uplifted by inflation and so the council will need to manage um, within each year's budget setting process the expectation that those contracts will increase in order to continue to commit to that real living wage I mean we will need to continue to have robust conversations with suppliers um, on that to make sure that whilst we will we will match their real living wage commitments that they are making other efficiencies that we might expect them to make so um, it does create a financial commitment it will be difficult but it's clearly an administration priority that we will have to use in the round in setting and prioritizing budgets for future years. Councillor Anderson next. Thank you. Um, well, I'll kind of echo what others have said and kind of thank all three of you and the really difficult work you had to kind of technical work you've had to do in the last uh, six months because it's uh, I don't I don't envy you. Um, I think it's like kind of two questions. One, you mentioned obviously the kind of the last 13 years kind of real term reductions in kind of funding for the local government. Obviously, that's now been complemented by in the last six to 12 months, uh, kind of unstable, volatile kind of global economic environment, rising interest rates, rising inflation. It'd be really just good to get your take on how that has affected your ability to actually kind of formulate this kind of the medium term financial strategy uh, to manage kind of the council's cash flows and treasury and to actually recalibrate the council's uh, approach to corporate risk. So that's my first question. And then my second question is regards to the reserves. Now, I understand that you know, the last kind of obviously that position is improving and it's certainly improved with comparison to say five years ago and i also understand that, that you know our approach to it has been questioned by other political parties um in ealing and so just be good again good to get your uh it's probably more for council donnelly just kind of good to get your take on what ealing's kind of new strategy is or approach um, with regards to kind of building to reserves that were kind of resilient in, in, in the medium to long term. Thank you. Thank you. Plenty to get my teeth into. Uh, and, there, and thank you for your thank you. Um, <laughs> there, there, I will, I will certainly, um, uh, there is a proper tradition, which uh, Councillor Young will remember for many years, that we, we thank our officers for the work they do in building the budget. And we do so not glibly but because it's it's a tremendous effort to dig down right into the weeds of all of our all of our finances there are there I don't know Emily may even know how many individual finance lines there are across the organization and I joke that we we make very we make very precise estimates of each one but ultimately you you it, there is an art as well as a science in seeking to work out how these things will will balance over the end of the over the end of the year so uh, my thanks uh, go and will go to all of them uh, in terms of volatil volatility exactly right i mean and it links through to your second question which i will come to around uh, around reserves uh, as far as you know a medium term perspective goes um we we still don't have one um anybody those 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 um happy few who sit through uh, my quarterly reports to cabinet uh will hear me say every time that we are obliged to produce something called a medium-term financial forecast in the absence of 
meaningful medium-term financial information. But we we doggedly persevere, and, and we do so. And the figures that, that are published within the budget show you the kind of volatility. You know, it's a, it's a big dip there, and it's a bit better there. And I tell you someone else who agrees that there isn't any meaningful medium-term financial information is the current uh, and previous, but the once and future uh, Secretary of State for uh, the department, uh, Michael Gove, who has confirmed that he thinks there isn't any medium term information and, and has uh, indicated a wish to bring a, a longer term view uh, to the table. He has not uh, yet done so. But to be fair, he was sacked about two weeks after initially saying that this was his intention. And it took him another four months to get his job back. So uh, we shall see. The one thing he has said in terms of future years is what, where the council tax and social care preset setting limits will be for um, 24, 25, which will be as, well, unless the Treasury tell him he can't, will be uh, as they are for 23. 24. So that's the one piece of information that we have, which is about how much we're allowed to, to raise taxes uh, locally. Um, I mean, in terms of corporate risk, I mean, I, I think we, the volatility means we, we have to take very careful thought about almost anything uh, that, that we do, you know, where we, we have had um, and have ambitious um, projects around uh, affordable housing, you know, the, the impact of inflation on the construction market has been profound, and we wrestle with the implications of that project by project, week by week, almost you know, day by day, hour by hour, uh, sometimes. But, but, you know, we take a very careful and I hope thoughtful approach to how we manage uh, corporate risk. On the reserves, I think we made the right call last year to build in a year on year increase, um, uh, which was criticized by both the opposition parties in the budget debate last year. Um, I think, you know, it's always nice to feel vindicated, but it's not a it's not a personal thing. I think we put ourselves in a stronger position. Um, I think if you look at the SIPFA graph, it shows that we've made progress. I mean, you could argue all day about where exactly on that line is the right place. Well, right according to it, right will be different for different people. The, the boroughs on either side of us could be half our size, you know. So we, we have to think carefully about what, what where's right sized in terms of reserves. But the more interesting indicators were the ones at the top, which were the direction of travel indicators, uh, some of which still showed, you know, risk increasing. Others, though, had gone in the other direction from last year. And I think having that kind of recognition from SIPFA was, was, was very re reassuring. Uh, we'll keep looking at this, but I, I don't think it's right to um, give up on the reserve boosting strategy at, at this point, certainly. Thank you. I'll try not to prolong uh, too, uh, too much. I, I think um, just sort of picking up um, some of your points, Camp Fanton, on sort of the medium term. I have to say that the, any report that I write with a medium term position gives a big caveat uh, as to this is the best estimate that we can come up with. Um, uh, the council spends over a billion pounds uh, national, uh, annually. So sort of as, as Councillor Donnelly said, we have to sort of take big swings and we have to manage it within our overall spending position. Um, I would say we 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 take a best guess based on experience and any sort of information that we have uh, on expected inflation figures, but even expected inflation figures uh, haven't quite been been uh, 
found to be true uh, as that's gone through. I would say um, sort of to the point on reserves, we have to be really careful about overestimating a gap as well, because if we overestimate a gap, it leads us to a position where we have to talk about quite significant savings that are cutting vital public services to our residents. So whilst, whilst we, um, we have to be prudent because I have to set a balanced budget. We also don't want to be in a position where we're sort of creating uh, a situation where we, we're making decisions that we don't want to make. And that sort of goes back to uh, Councillor Donnelly's point around reserves, because if we, for some reason, for the best intentions, don't quite get the gap right and we don't deliver and identify the savings, we do have and then the sort of funding announcement comes late and it's not quite what we expected we have reserves to be able to fill that gap for the year rather than taking a really drastic action on services to then have the next year to work its way out so you always hope you don't need to do that year on year but but because we get the late funding announcement it's always a possibility so it's important to have that level of reserves to say we will manage through this year to balance the budget and we take a longer term view in transformation and change like you were talking about Councillor Crawford uh, to do that because as, as Councillor Kelly has said, the environment has been unprecedented. And so, so we, we don't want to make short term decisions and the, the way that we can enable that is through having reserves to enable us to, do, to, to smooth things out. Councillor Ball. Thank you. Um, and oops. Sorry, Councillor Ball, well. that was. All oh, right. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. So, um, yes, uh, I add my thanks to uh, Emily and Shabana as well. Um, I, I'd uh, also. <laughs> oh, I thank you as well, Stephen, always. <laughs> Councillor Donnelly. Um, you're, you're very welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's also about risk. Um, I, I, I'd like to ask how much of a risk it is that we have such a large amount of borrowing um so a capital financing requirement of over a billion pounds with actual borrowing from the pwlb of three quarters of a billion which i understand it's it's much higher than our comparative authorities in west london could you just answer that yeah thanks well obviously i'll let emily um give the detail it, it it may appear odd but it's good news uh the um it's certainly more than we would normally hold, but we borrowed in um, anticipation of expenditure on capital projects, particularly construction projects, which which have been slower to come along than we expected. Um, but the timing of that large scale borrowing um, was propitious because we've been able to invest the money that we've held at much higher rates of interest than we've been paying. Um, perhaps I shouldn't say this on a public, but I've said it already on other, in other meetings, but so hopefully the public uh, works loan board won't find out. But the, we're, we're making money and it, it's, been, it's, it's been a very serendipitous um, thing. It's not something that we can budget around. We're not a, we're not a bank. Uh, at some point, these, these reserves will be depleted because we will make the spending on the projects for which the, the, the borrowing was done. But it but it's not bad news because you know it of the contrary, we're doing well. Thank you. Um yes, um as you say sort of a billion pounds sounds like a, a heady figure in terms of borrowing. Um uh, I, I'm not uh, concerned particularly around the risk around that. The Treasury strategy, which we mentioned in, I sort of skipped over really in the presentation, requires councils to set and understand their borrowing within prudential limits so that we are being prudent when we borrow. Um, unlike um, our, if we're fortunate enough to have them, I guess, or unfortunately in current times, our mortgages where, where we may have seen rent uh, rate increases the way in which the council borrows is at a fixed rate. And so we won't see that change. And as Councillor Donnelly said, um, <clears throat> whilst I'd love to take credit for it, it wasn't me. It was my predecessor who uh, had some amazing timing in taking out that borrowing at those, those low uh, fixed rates. So in terms of the risk of the sort of interest 
um, sort of going up on that and being unaffordable. It's it's locked in and it's locked in at particularly low rates, which which is um, which is excellent. And we have uh, lots to thank my predecessor and, and Steve also being consulted on that. The, sorry, Councillor Donnelly also being consulted on that um, decision. So um, in terms of that sort of interest rate risk on borrowing to date, um, I, I'm not particularly um, concerned. As the council um, has significant sort of capital plans, and we talked about the capital program and uh, business cases to come through, those business cases do need to be robust because that borrowing does have a revenue impact on the council, and therefore um, we um, uh, we must make sure that as 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 we we go into those, for, um, there are sufficient revenue streams to be able to to cover those costs or the, the only other alternative is that the council must make savings in order to finance those costs um so so, so yes in terms of current borrowing i'm i'm comfortable and we're in a fortunate position and as we go forward with that that we must make decisions that are prudent and ensure that we can afford that level of borrowing councillor young thanks Thank you. First of all, can I add my thanks to others for the officer's hard work? We, we, we thank you for a very, very good reason. We really appreciate the amount of work that goes into producing a budget each year. You're not included, I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a question on the additional council tax support fund. We're being, being given by the government a sum of £631,000. And we're spending about £400,000 of that on the £40 of the war, which is £25 um, mandated and £15 locally determined. I've got three questions. Oh, and we're giving then that leaves us £230,000 or more, which we're putting into our discretionary scheme. I've got three questions. One is, how much is the existing discretionary scheme fund? And is it realistic that we're going to spend another £200,000 or £230,000 from that? Two, is there any risk of clawback? And three, why don't we distribute more in the first place? Everybody. Well, uh, Emily's got the numbers again. Why won't we do it to everybody? We don't think that's the most effective use of the money. Um, we have uh, a very generous scheme as it stands, but no scheme no arrangement takes account of all eventualities um and the, the schemes as they exist um and emily will correct me if i'm wrong uh, really it's a question of where you find yourself on a given day and people people move around and the reason we want to make the discretionary fund two reasons um one we don't believe the world is going to be all uh, uh, bread and roses in the course of the next few months because the economy is still in the place. I said something about no political, but um, you can understand, it, didn't I? Uh, yeah, things aren't looking too good in national politics, um, and we don't. We think it's a sensible thing to give ourselves a larger discretionary pot to deal with the wide range of people who are suffering uh, because of the economic. Um, problems that the country is 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 facing i'll leave uh, the rest of them thank you chair um yes that's right so so um in terms of once we've taken the uh, 40 pounds um uh, amount uh to those receiving council tax support on the 1st of april when they are issued their bill there will be a, a, a remaining sum of of circa 230 uh, which we will be putting into the discretionary um, pot. So the, I think your first question was, what is the current council tax scheme? And it's, it's almost, um, it's a strange thing. You often see numbers come up twice, but it's very similar to the um, additional amount that we're putting in. So the discretionary pot will essentially double from 230 to roughly 460 uh, in terms of that. Now, uh, the... Um, that that budget there has been uh, the same for uh, a good while. Clearly, uh, the count, uh, the cost of living crisis has put more pressure on that budget 
um, than ever before. So we believe it's the right thing to put, do to put into discretionary. That discretionary then um, can be used, as I say, the, the, the government scheme is to pay everybody who is in place receiving council tax support on the 1st of April. So someone who then becomes eligible for council tax support after that date wouldn't receive that £40 that you you that, that the others would. So they, in that case, would apply to the discretionary fund and therefore get additional support that way. So we would still expect, for example, that that um, any new person coming in would receive, again, that, that £40 um, or, or other support. As well as that, um, the discretionary fund would allow anybody who does receive the £40 if still in significant financial difficulty in paying the remainder of their bill to apply to that discretionary fund as well to support them in there. Um, in terms, I mean, that, that fund can be, um, we would usually sort of in, in the council budget terms, if we sort of finished the spend on that budget, we would have to be more and more careful in in giving out additional support so it does allow that leeway for the council to continue provide support um, when the council budget essentially has run out as to the risk of clawback we don't believe there to be any but we fully expect to spend that money on providing council tax support it is given to us by government to provide residents with support those residents on council tax support to receive additional support to their scheme. So we will look to continue to promote that scheme to ensure that we spend the total allocation. Uh, so uh, so it, it, I, we don't believe there's risk of clawback, but certainly we expect to spend it all so that there wouldn't in any case be any clawback. Um, I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing on the third question. I think it says distribution. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, we also have something called the Local Welfare Allowance Scheme. So that's, again, for crisis. So not a, not as well as the, the discretionary fund we have, which we kind of look for hardship to kind of give it an addition. We also have the Local Welfare Allowance Scheme, and we are spending both of them much more than what we've kind of have used but we've also had the housing support fund so so we've got a lot of grants that have been kind of come to target through we do we do envisage that people are going to probably likely to be a hardship if we don't look to use it for that I'm sure it will be reviewed and kind of reallocated through but as Emily has said there's new people as they come through on council tax so the 40 pound estimate might be much higher um, to what we kind of set aside so it's kind of balancing it within that but something that we will monitor actively through the year and and that's Shavanna makes uh, absolutely the, the right point I, I think uh, you, you're right uh, to to ask the question Councillor Young in that this money is provided in order to help us support our residents so we will need to monitor that number through the year and if it appears that we are not spending in line with it we will have to revisit and consider whether there is another way to ensure that we get that money out and provide that support to the residents. Thank you. Um, so we have a few more questions. Councillor Rice is next. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, officers, and also Councillor Donnelly. Um, so, but I'll, I will apologise, though, because I'm going to go into the fees and charges, but not going through the whole lot, not, not, not right now. Um, because what I'm just looking at is on the libraries section, um, because I'm I'm just I'm just asking about uh, about when it comes down to reservations from the British Library and periodical articles from the British Library, um, because I'm just wondering about how it is we come to a decision as to and um, how we subsidise those, um, because I, the way I'm looking at it is that when it comes down to a periodical article, we're subsidising to the amount of six pounds fifty, if I've got my figures correct, in terms of what we get from the British Library. Um, however, um, if we, if, you know, if we're talking about a book loan, we're talking about a subsidy of um, 70p. Now, I'm just wondering as to why we've got a situation why we're actually subsidising periodical articles to such an extent when people, most people who actually want out, um, access to articles, they'll probably be at a university and would actually be able to get hold of the articles through another source. And so they would have a subsidy there. And so why are we subsidising that? Would it, be, would it make more sense if we actually gave more to our other 
library users who just want to get hold of books, for example, pensioners who might want to um, do, do some research in books, older books that are only available elsewhere. Thank you. Answer that, please. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't, I'm not sure I have um, an answer to that to give you this <laughs> evening. Um, but, I, but, but no, that it, it, it is absolutely where, where the council is providing a subsidy and not doing anything at full cost. It should absolutely have a rationale um, behind that as to, as to why it wants to do that. I, I'm not clear, I'm, I'm sorry, councillor, as to sort of the, the, the level of subsidy. I'm not clear that I recognise a sort of six pounds subsidy. I've got that from the British Library because as I say that is actually what I do for a living. I, I work so in Minton Library Loans. Yes, yeah, sorry. That's what I, I think maybe a follow-up email exchange yeah, yeah. Ra rather than uh, uh, prolonging the, the meeting. No, 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 you, you, no, I appreciate that, Councillor Rice. So we'll, we'll go next to Councillor Summers. You'll be glad to know my question's been answered. Good man. <laughs> Councillor Brett. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the question is really around um, additional kind of business rates and fees, etc. Um, Councillor Tyke and I um, have had um, a meeting with um, some local um, small businesses in our ward, um, and they've strongly voiced real concern um, about some of the fees that potentially are, are going to go up. Um, and also fees that they're currently paying as well. Um, and I think it's been recognised that it's been a tough two, three years in general. Um, and I think small businesses have probably suffered quite a bit um, over that time. Um, so I, I think that they're, they're really concerned. So I just wanted to get a bit more detail on the rationale and also what fees are going to go up for small businesses and, you know, our high street, you know, cafes, bars, et cetera. Thank you. So you said business rates. Did you mean business rates or rates and fees for businesses? Rates and fees for businesses and business rates. I know that business rates are governed by, not by us, but we collect them. But yeah, the, the rest as well. I think that they're concerned about the whole mix. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, Emily touched on the way in which uh, you got this shift in the way in which money was moved around, take give with one hand, take with the other. W one of the potential issues for us in the way that the business business rates has, has changed is, is that we will have uh, more risk, more of our income will be at risk because it's down to what we collect than was the case before. So um, <laughs> that there is harder work for us in, in, in getting our income. Um, in, it says, I mean, if you could give particular examples of what people thought, I mean, we, we consulted with Ealing Business Partnership um, last week, and I don't think anything of that, that kind came up specifically. I, I think it's, there, are, there are charges that, are, that currently exist, um, and they're concerned about whether they're going to go up. So things like um, charging for kind of waste disposal, um, things like um, shop being able to display outside your shop and the fees that they have to pay for that. Um, if the business is in uh, a potential CPZ and the charges that um, they would have to pay for just one vehicle um, annually um, and all of those costs amalgamating over the course of a, a 12 month period, plus the fact that but obviously not in our control, energy prices for them have gone up as well. Um, that was the kind of, you know, the general um, points they were trying to make um, to myself and Councillor Tyke. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so so it's undoubtedly um, difficult for businesses and, and residents at the moment. Just having a quick sort of flick through all the different fees and charges. I think um, in terms of parking, there, there, there aren't many um, ch changes in there in the fees and charges schedule. And as I've mentioned earlier, we don't set parking for revenue generating purposes. It's more uh, transport related purposes. So, um, so, so parking, uh, I don't expect they would see significant changes. There are a number of fees um, for businesses uh, around licensing, for example, and those fees are actually set by government rather than us. So 
but they're ones where we would we we wouldn't sort of have any sort of say over particularly uh, the one um that you've mentioned around commercial waste i think is probably the most significant one and actually i'm afraid they, those are going to uh, increase the reason particularly why that has to increase in the council is that commercial waste is something that we are required to set on a commercial basis because there are commercial operators um doing similar things and so because of the increases in costs really of those services I mean um uh, uh trying to think of the right word I want to say petrol fuel um fuel prices have gone up for example that 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 changes the price and also the the prices of waste disposal um increase so we we will see unfortunately changes in um uh waste commercial waste um Services they can of course, um, and we wouldn't necessarily want them to. And I think we provide a, a good value for money services, but they can look elsewhere for those. They aren't services they must take from the council if they believe that there is a better value offer um, elsewhere. And I think the last area that you talked about was street trading. Um, those fees are um, they are increasing in line with inflation to meet those costs. Uh, I think that is really only the explanation we can give them in that our costs are increasing significantly and we've had to increase our fees in order to meet um, those those costs. So I've got three more questioners and then we're going to wrap up. So Councillor Kingston. Yeah, I think we're all more than aware that the cost of um, adult social care is the biggest expenditure for the council. Um, I just want to know when we are modelling um, for the budget, there's also the human side of um, the cost of living crisis, but obviously it's going to take its toll on depression, domestic violence, and breakdown, which is obviously going to um, incur costs. Has that been built in? Uh, insofar as we're able to forecast anything absolutely um that is going into some of those demand pressures because cost of living does it's not only on people's inability to pay bills it causes pressures on people's lives as you said the human costs really that that does mean that that services that a particular one for example is homelessness as well cost of living crisis creates more homelessness issues so we we wherever we can we factor it in it is very difficult to guess what the impact is going to be and clearly we do as much work as we can to prevent those people um those residents entering into those systems really it's much much better to prevent it so yes it's exactly the area where we've got that increased demand that green part of the pie chart that we looked at but um it, it is our best guess and, and just um so I think is relevant to the point you're making. We keep, we keep an eye when we, um, obviously, tracking the costs and impact and demands on our social care, both adults and children. <clears throat> that's a big that's a big part of my uh, role in the last couple of years. And one thing we've seen is that kind of what we call our front door, that the people who come and kind of talk to us through whatever means that the numbers keep going up now not all of those people present with circumstances that prove to be relevant to necessarily our adult social care team and we would seek to redirect people to you know the the appropriate agency or, or service but I, th I think it indicates very much that point that the number of people making in, in a in a quiet or a louder way a cry for help is still rising you know so which looks back to do i do i think we'll have the capacity to spend money to help people out as councillor young asked yes i think we will do i think we got enough of it no i don't that's risky uh, I, I just wanted to clarify a bit more detail on the reprofiling. Um, I mean, I'm I'm used to hearing about cost shunts from central government where we get new responsibilities and lo and behold, we don't get as much money to compensate for that responsibility. But just trying to get a bit more specific about what's happened this year, that would be helpful to understand where the shifting sands are going. Thank you. Uh, 
what, what from a political standpoint, it's a shift from we can spend money we can spend on anything to money we can only spend on certain things. Now, those are certain things which, and we've just been talking about, it, everyone's agreed need more spending on them. But but in that in that movement, in that um, administrative device, it, it reduces our flexibility. And if that keeps happening year on year on year on year, then obviously the longer term implications of that will not be positive. Thank you. Yes. Um, if you sort of went back to the slide where we sort of set out the twenty million pounds increase in grant, uh, the biggest sort of deductions you see are two grants. So you saw um, the cessation really of what was called the lower tiers grant. Um, and the lower tiers grant was essentially those provided to um, district councils and uh, unit two authorities. So, so that so district council services are essentially um, those that aren't social care. Um, so, environment services like um, uh, planning, uh, waste collection, disposal, uh, waste collection. Sorry. So, so, so that grant ceased. So that sort of move away from social care there and the reduction in services grant and services grant was an unallocated grant um, to pay for wider council services. So you see those two grants ceasing or reducing and then you see the, the increases in the adult social care um, grants as well. Um, at, and we also saw a number of sort of more specific grants um, that have now been rolled up into overall core funding. So food safety and those sort of council tax admin um, and council tax family annex ones. So, so what we're seeing um, here is a sort of moving of, of millions of pounds outside of social care into social care. And one thing that we don't uh, sort of comment on here because it wasn't particularly relevant to Ealing, but it probably shows that sort of direction of travel was that the government also introduced uh, this year a sort of minimum funding increase guarantee so that any council with all of these ups and downs would still receive an increase to help it manage uh, inflation. Uh, that didn't uh, apply to most um, council, most councils or any London borough and I think indeed any um, county council what that minimum guarantee was there to do was to protect those district councils providing those lower tier environment universal type services because otherwise the sort of redistribution of grant meant that they were in a position that they weren't receiving an increase so I think that minimum funding guarantee also shows that sort of direction of travel pushing money away from those universal services into social care. Thank you and then the final question Councillor Ty. Uh, Chair Ashley, Councillor Brett did a great job putting the questions we met with local businesses last week. If I could just add just one tiny question, uh, just on the instruction page, it talks about business rates, discount for 23-24, and just a question, is that like a continuation of the discount or is there an extension? Uh, as Councillor Brett has said, just to be able to kind of go back, because we heard a lot about the concerns last week um, that, that high street shops are facing, I suppose, and just a reminder, when we see the word business, um, sometimes you know, it's like small family-run businesses, livelihoods and all the rest. So we, there was one place that we were in, they had their energy uh, bill stuck up on the counter saying this is triple just to kind of get their point across. So any good news we could go back with would be brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the discount, the business rates we were looking at is, is a continuation of a current um, a current discount that's available. Um, in terms of good news for um, businesses, I, I mentioned the business rates revaluation, of course, which, which could um, well lead to higher uh, business rates bills for um, our businesses. Uh, they, they tend to be particularly the bigger increases are sort of more on the industrial uh, estates. Uh, and so you would hope probably not hitting so much those smaller local businesses as you say sort of family run with, with sort of livelihoods um I, I would say though that there is um a transitional scheme to provide support to those businesses that do experience increases in bills so that they are smooth so I think very um they should be applied um 
think automatically. So hopefully, but, but the, the other thing is on this reevaluation, I think if they do think that it's wrong, that they should uh, sort of make a case to have that valuation checked. It's not something that's done by the council, it's done by the valuation office. Um, so, so they should um, just challenge, I guess, the increase uh, in their bills. And um, those, there is already a small business rates relief um, and those who might lose it due to the revaluation, um, they will have a limit to their increase. So, uh, probably not the best of news in, in a situation with, with any increase, but I think um, just to say that those sort of headline messages of potential increases in business rates will hopefully be uh, mitigated in, in doing that and to make sure that they sort of challenge those um, in doing so. I think the only thing I would echo is that because of the, the way the revaluation is now on a quicker cycle in, in three years, there's also a time limit in terms of challenging those decisions. So if businesses feel like, and even if they don't know if it's right or wrong, it's good to kind of them to lodge that appeal because at least it gets recognized within a very small time frame. They do have, I think, three months or something from, from noting it. We previously had a couple of years to kind of note that through. So if they feel like, that it's too high or or they don't agree with it, they should immediately lodge it as well. Just on the real living wage point, come back to it. It's, it's a, a key target of my colleague, Councillor Mahfouz's portfolio to get out into, not so we talked about really where the council has a, an economic relationship with, with providers, with customers, businesses. This about getting out into the community as a whole to encourage payment of the real living wage. And also even where people are actually paying it, but they don't talk about it. We, we want it more talks about to get people to engage with the, with the Living Wage Foundation, but for it to become, you know, a, a, a very public, a public virtue, um, something with, with real lasting general uh, public benefits. And then we we get the snowball rolling, and people think, "Oh, I want to be, I want to be part of that." Um, and if the discount scheme can do something to to keep that going, then we're right behind it. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, everybody, for all your questions. Thank you for the answers. It's really good. I think we just note the uh, budget <laughs> oh, or, or, as approved uh, tomorrow. I'm sure. Thank you very much. We have one item left on the agenda, everybody. It's the work programme, item seven. Um, you've all have seen it. Are we happy for that? Yes, I'm sure everybody's very happy. Uh, we are starting, we are working on next year's overview and scrutiny and panels and so on. So if anyone has any comments, questions, get in touch with me and we can have a chat. That's the end of the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. And thought we'd do it by 10. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, well, bye -bye. <laughs> Well done, everybody.